or maybe you can text them or something just because we have 44 attendees now. Okay, so um, welcome everybody. This is the March 25th meeting of the Berkeley Board of Education. Um, and I we usually start with Ms. Pacheco, who's our secretary, um, giving some brief announcements. Good evening, everyone. I would like to provide a brief overview of tonight's meeting. After a few procedural items, the board will hear, will hear approximately 30 minutes of public comment. At the end of the meeting, which will end at, at around 10 p.m., there will be another opportunity for additional public comment. So if you don't get to speak at the beginning of the meeting, you can stay and speak at the end of the meeting. To comment by video conference, click on the participants button at the bottom of your screen and select the raise your hand button to request to speak when the public comment is being taken on the eligible agenda item. When called upon, you will be unmuted after the allotted time you will then be remuted. To comment by phone, you will be prompted to raise your hand by pressing nine to request to speak when public comment is being taken on the eligible agenda item. When called upon, you will be unmuted. After the allotted time, you will then be remuted. The board president usually will call our students first. Please note that if there are a lot of people who want to make public comment, not everyone who raises their hand will get to speak. The board president will determine whether to set tonight's speaking time at two or three minutes per speaker. On an individual's basis, the board president also has the discretion to allow for extra time for those who need translation or have other speech needs. When your time has elapsed, you will hear your time is up. If you are still speaking when your time is up, you are, you are allowed to finish your sentence, but please do not try to speak beyond your time. We understand that there are really important issues that many people feel very passionate about. However, in order to be fair to all speakers, and so we can hear as many speakers as possible, the board president will ask you to stop once your time has elapsed and will ask that the mic be turned off if it is necessary. Thank you. Carol, do you wanna, Ms. Pacheco, will you go ahead and say that and, and translate that into Spanish? Claro. Buenas tardes. Voy a proporcionarles un breve resumen sobre esta junta. Después de unos procedimientos preliminares, un periodo de 30 minutos será dedicado a, a comentarios públicos. Luego habrá otra oportunidad para escuchar comentarios de parte de comités y uniones distritales, seguidos por comentarios de parte de la mesa directiva y el superintendente. Al final de la junta, que usualmente puede ser cerca de las 10, habrá una segunda y última oportunidad para comentarios de parte de miembros de la audiencia que no pudieron proporcionar comentario durante la oportunidad. Para dar comentario durante la conferencia de video, por favor presione el botón que dice levante la mano en el abajo donde está el botón de participantes. Para hacer un comentario por teléfono, por favor oprima el número 9. El presidente de la mesa directiva te, determinará si va a otorgar dos o tres minutos por orador. El presidente también tiene la discreción de otorgar minutos adicionales a quienes requieran traducción o cualquier otra adaptación especial. Durante su comentario se dará cuenta. Durante su comentario se dará cuenta. Es, no aplica a esta parte de la junta, así que voy a leer la segunda oración, la siguiente oración. Um, por favor, trate de no sobrepasar su tiempo. Entendemos que hay diferencias, pues, cuestiones que son muy importantes para diferentes personas. Sin embargo, pedimos que respete el tiempo otorgado de manera que podamos escuchar a la mayoría del público posible. Gracias. 
Thank you, Ms. Pacheco. Gracias. Um, okay, so um, we're now, uh, I'm gonna spend a couple minutes just talking about the meeting. Um, um, so the way that we're going to do this is, first we're gonna have comments from people um, from the unions, or from the unions, and then from people on committees. Um, Jay, do we have anyone from committees who wants to talk? I don't think so, no. Okay, so, um, and then after the unions, um, we will um, have, we'll have opportunities for all of us to say a few words, and the superintendent. Then we are going to, in case you don't have the agenda in front of you, and you can access it online, but um, we're gonna do the consent cal calendar, and um, I'm just gonna read off the things on this consent calendar, if we pass this agenda. Approval of human resources report, approved listings of warrants issued in February, payroll warrants issued in February, approval of contract for non-public agency services for the 1920 school year, um, approval of contract amendment for residential non-public school for 2019 and 2020 school year, normative services, acceptance of gifts and donations, and approval of contracts, purchase orders for service con services contract. So these are the items that you know, our, our school district has been working incredibly hard. Um, and so these are items that they're bringing to us for approval that we, um, that we've agreed don't require um, discussion. And then the two action items are district plans related to the COVID-19 and distance learning. There's gonna be a 90 minute presentation offered, I believe by our superintendent and, um, and then updated budget development calendar. Um, and then there was one discussion item um, about the Berkeley Recruitment and Retect Retention Act. Um, and we have um, decided to forward that to another meeting. So um, what I'm gonna do is ask for somebody to make a motion to pass the agenda um, without number 13. Oh, I'm sorry. After, the, after those discussion items, we'll have another opportunity for people to talk. And then um, if we want to make any other comments and then an adjournment. And the only thing I do want to make sure to say is when I call for public comment, um, what you're going to do is go into the participant, um, the participant button on your, uh, on your computer. And then the, um, all, of the, uh, um, all of the names of all the attendees and the panelists, we're panelists, you guys are on the, public at our attendees are going to come up. And then what I'm going to do is we're each going to each of the public comment people speaking at public comment are going to have two minutes. And I do what I'm going to ask is first to have the students raise their hand if there's any students that want to give testimony because those always come first. And then after that, I will ask everybody else to raise their hand. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll have to see how many people are interested in talking before we can decide if we can hear from all of you. Are there any, is that clear to everybody? Did um, you ask for a motion to accept the agenda first? Yeah, no, no. Well, first I just wanted to go over that a little bit. So um, I guess I'm gonna assume that that's clear and if not, you can raise your hand to ask a question. So yes, do I have a motion from somebody to- um, President Appel, I think we, we, did we call the roll? Did Ms. Pacheco call the roll? Oh. Good point, Vice President Alper. So, um, Ms. Pacheco, will you go ahead and call the roll? Yes. President Appel? Here. Vice President Alper? Here. Director Brown? Present. Directora Leva Cutler? Presente. Director Sinai? Here. And student director Hemp is participating and we're working on getting her set up as a panelist. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there anything else I missed, Vice President Alper? No, you're good. All right. So um, with that being said, um, is there somebody who will make the motion to, uh, to pass the agenda with, uh, and with item 13 excluded? I'll make the motion um, to pass the agenda. With item 13 excluded? With that, my item 13. Is there a second? I'll second. Seconded by um, Director Brown. 
Um, Carol, um, Ms. Pacheco, would you mind taking a roll call vote? Not at all. Um, Director Sinai? Yes. Directora Leva Cutler? Yes. Director Brown? Yes. Vice President Alper? Yes. President Appel? Yes. Okay, so um, we're off to a good start. Um, so now we're going to go ahead. And next thing on the agenda is to do, um, oh, is to report out on the closed session. And I'm going to ask Vice President Alper to do that. Thank and you. If, while, while he's doing that, if the students who want to give testimony can press at the bottom of your, oh, I don't see it now. At the bottom of the participant roll, oh wait, I don't see a hand raising thing for them, for attendees. Do you guys, what I want is for the attendees who are listening and want to, the students who want to speak, if you can raise your hand, um, I'm assuming people can see that. And um, so I'm gonna have the students go while um, Ty Alper is reporting back. Okay. Um, thank you, President Powell. There was only we the closed session was called to order at seven o'clock. Um, there was only one item, item three point one point one, case number CL number two zero zero four zero two eight five one five. There's a motion by Director Leva Cutler to approve the staff recommendation, second by Director Sinai. All voted in favor and the motion passed five to zero. And that concludes the report from closed session. Excellent job, Vice President Alper. You must do this every day. Thank you, I practiced all day. There you go. Excuse me, okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and start closed session. Um, so I was told by somebody who was on, who's, who's on as an attendee that you, you can see how to raise your hand. So I'm just gonna ask any students if there are any on who wish to speak. Um, if you're on the Zoom app, um, just go ahead and raise your hand. And if you are on calling by phone, um, just do star nine and um, our host will inform me that you want to speak. Okay, I see, oh, um, Vanessa D. Marrero. You, um, President Appel, do you see our comments? Our union comments didn't go first. We're yes. going first to public comment. Oh. Oh, I'm um, actually, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, you're right. Can you hang on a second, Vanessa? Um, and I'm going to go ahead and call on Matt Meyer because I, I'm sorry, I just read the agenda wrong, but if he's right. The union comments do come first, and I believe the only union president or union representative who's here is Matt Meyer for the Berkeley Federation of Teachers. Um, Matt, we cannot hear you. I cannot hear you. I don't know, Jay, maybe if no, you, we can't hear if I don't know if you can do anything to to help. Um, great. I just got unmuted. Oh, yeah. great. You guys have to um, you, you control it. <laughs> yeah. Well, someone there does. Yes. Um, OK, um, thanks for this meeting. Uh, looks a lot like all my meetings and for the past two weeks. I'm happy uh, to be speaking with you. I haven't really had time to really prepare um, a formal speech, but I, I really just felt like I wanted to be here um, to kind of sort of express how hard our teachers and counselors and staff members have been working uh, these last couple of weeks, getting uh, distance learning uh, up and running checking in on their students. Uh, we've had grade level teams meeting. We've had counselors 
making sure that students um, who are in, in family situations that aren't great um, have someone to check in with. Uh, you know, curriculum is going out. Uh, there's been staff meetings this week. You know, all kinds of things are happening. Uh, I also wanted to say that BFT has been working closely with the superintendent and other administrators on uh, really making sure that this plan uh, that is going to be presented today sort of, uh, you know, represents our best thinking uh, right now at this very dynamic situation where we really don't know what's going to happen from day to day. Uh, so we really wanted to, to uh, collaborate on a plan that sort of you know, respected the seriousness of what we're all dealing with and also keeping students first and making sure that they can get the best education um, possible given all the different limitations that, uh, that we're dealing with. Uh, so you, you'll get a lot of details in this 90-minute uh, uh, session that's coming up. But I, I, you know, I just really wanted to say that it's been uh, great working with uh, Dr. Stevens uh, on this plan uh, and I've included, you know, my executive board sort of knew the, the big generalizations of what was going on, but I, I think that um, teachers are going to be very happy to, to really get started. They, uh, they want to get started. They've been doing things, you know, but it hasn't been formalized. Uh, and now finally it can be formalized. And there's gonna, the way we made the plan is that there's just gonna be a lot of consistency that is happening. We wanted to make sure that given our different access to technology, uh, different grade levels, you know, some grade levels don't even use computers at all, right? So, uh, you know, like K through TK through two, you know, it's like a whole different situation. The shelter in place really complicated things. You can't make packets. You can't get them out, um, you know. So, uh, really trying to. It just took a little, a, a small number of days to really think about how can we make every grade level work. Uh, and I think teachers are going to be really pleased uh, that they can participate. Uh, that they're going to be doing things with their students. Their students are going to feel like they're part of a community. We're going to have, you know, Zoom, Google Hangout things happening. There's going to be Google Classroom stuff. There's going to be professional development. Uh, and, you know, we don't know how long we're going to be in this situation, but we're just going to make the best of it uh, and do the best we can given, you know, what's happening. So thanks. And, you know, hope to be back at the next board meeting to tell you how it's going. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. That's great. Um, I, oh, our student board member, Stella Hem, has joined us. Welcome. Oh, you're mute. You're Hi, everyone. Hi. Good afternoon. Okay. So um, I now want to ask for any attendee who's a student who would like to speak, um, make a comment. There had been one person, um, but that is, I mean, her, I guess she doesn't want to speak anymore. Is there, are there any students who do? There was a student, Vanessa, uh, was uh, going in for her daughter, Carmen. Vanessa, if you're still there. Vanessa Marrero. Um, hold on, let me see if I can, un she might still be muted, one moment. So many people, I have to scroll all the way down to V. Okay, here we go. Uh, Vanessa, I'm gonna unmute you now. Okay, you should be able to speak, Vanessa and Carmen. They're muted. Okay, trying again. All right, go ahead, try again. Okay, hi, thank you. I'm here with Carmen. Um, I'm Carmen's mom. And she um, is, is extremely shy, so she thought she would be able to type. Um, but I want to empower her to express her um, concerns about what is happening with COVID-19. Um, would you like to talk? Okay, so, so she, um, <clears throat> Carmen is a Washington student. She loves Washington and she really misses school. And she really is trying to um, use a schedule, do her IXL, um, read her log. I mean, she has been incredibly dedicated, but she feels that she needs more structure. 
um, and she is very upset about the, print, the um, superintendent's announcement that school will not be in session until May 1st. And I did explain to her about this virus and you know we all understand why school is closed but um, I just wanted to you know empower um, this sharing to you all that you have a, an 11 year old student out here who really is looking forward to going back or at least having some structured approach so that she can continue her learning. Thank you so much for voicing that because is your daughter's name Carmen? Yeah, Carmen. Because Carmen, we're actually hearing from a lot of parents and students that, you know, they also are disappointed. And, um, and so I think it's really great that you came so you could voice that, um, you know, something you share with other students, which is, you know, that you really miss school. And, you know, we're, I, we're gonna hear more about what the plans are coming up from our superintendent, but I just wanted to, to thank you for coming and sharing your perspective. So now, um, if there are any other um, people who'd like to speak, now would be the time to raise your hand. Oh wait, you're, I'm not seeing hands. Um, somebody said, okay. Carol, did you say there is one person? It's number seven? Oh, I'm sorry, you were, you were responding to a question I have. So it looks like there are no public comments. There's no, you know you'll have an opportunity to speak again at the end of the meeting. President and, Appel, uh -huh. there is a chat from a Yuri S who is saying, hi, can I speak? Oh, yes, I'm actually gonna call on Kathleen Marte and, um, and then Yuri S, you'll go, oh, I'm sorry. Jay opened Yuri S first. So why don't, oh. Hello? Why don't you go ahead, Yuri S and. Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Great, okay. Hi, um, I'm a mother of a uh, BHS student. She's a ninth grader. And um, so is it true that um, when you guys resume, when the schools resume in May, Obviously, there's not going to be enough, you know, it's going to be a very short school year, probably, if it goes by the regular schedule, right? And um, I, there seems to be a rumor going around with just the students, possibly, that um, when the school resumes, um, anything actually after the scheduled date of like June, whenever, would be optional. Is that true? Um, in, in other words, um, will the school year end on time or, or will it, would it actually extend into the summer? That is the question. Um, I think, Yuri, thank you for the question. Um, I do know, obvi oh, I do know that there's obviously questions about like that, but um, we can't really respond to questions that come up during public comment, but. Um, oh, I see. But I think that um, Super, Superintendent Stevens will make sure to, to speak to that when he gives his presentation. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. No problem. Okay, so next, next I have Kathleen Marte. She's muted. Um, well, it says talking permitted. Okay. okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hi everyone, good evening. It's so wonderful to be able to see everyone here. And I want to um, thank um, those who made it possible for teachers to go into the schools today for very briefly and safely to get materials. I was able to pick up books and workbooks and things for um, some of my most needy students and some newcomers and drop off bags of materials for them. And I feel like that was really helpful. Um, in speaking with one of the parents during the drop-off, <clears throat> she has a kindergartner and was wondering about the Chromebooks and I said I didn't know. I explained that we're starting with distributing to high schoolers and I was wondering if possible for like for that grade level 
if there would be possibly iPads distributed? So that was my question. Thank you so much. Um, again, Superintendent Stevens can speak to that, but I feel comfortable saying that, you know, the, the Chromebooks we already own, the iPads we would have to buy. So um, I, Superintendent Stevens can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that, you know, we're using the computers that we already own that, and we have a one-to-one -one policy. So most of the time, you know, so there are, we have plenty of Chromebooks. And so if students need them, they should let us know. Okay, so now um, I have Sabrina, oh, I can't see your whole last name. Oh, Pinnell. Sabrina Pinnell, do you want to speak? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I haven't been to a school board meeting in a long time, um, but I'm a parent of, um, of Raven Elliott. He's a senior uh, in BIHS at Berkeley High. And his concern, and of course, you know, another student mentioned rumors um, that, well, mom, I heard that we're just gonna get a pass and we don't have to graduate. You know, we're just getting a pass to graduate. We don't have to finish the semester. So, I mean, that's kind of what's going on with the, you know, around and, and rumor talk uh, land with the seniors. So my um my request is just to hear more information about what's going to happen with the uh, class of 2020. okay well that is actually superintendent stevens long item tonight so just oh, great um and i just would like to know is there anyone else who wants to make a comment raise your hand if you do or press star nine if you're on the phone Oh, Hasmig. Hasmig um, Minassian, um, if you'd like to speak, why don't you go ahead and take the floor? Fantastic, oh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Great, hi everybody, really nice to see your faces. Hi Estella. So here's the thing I wanted to say that I was waiting for someone else to say. <clears throat> I just wanna thank you guys, really from the bottom of our hearts as teachers and as staff. Um, this is a really difficult moment for everyone. I just wanna acknowledge that and say that um, uh, Superintendent Stevens and President, Sh uh, Principal rather, although she should be President, Schwang, <laughs> have been doing an incredible job with communication. And I think that right now in a super uncertain moment <clears throat> where you're getting information, in some cases seconds before the rest of us are, <clears throat> distilling that information, figuring out how to get it to staff, um, allowing staff to communicate to families, allowing families to communicate to kids, um, this is really complex communication, and you are handling it with a grace um, that I am taking notes on. And so, Superintendent Stevens, I really just want to thank you um, for sort of jumping into this community and knowing exactly what they need. And uh, Principal Schwang, I really want to thank her for the way that she has communicated so consistently, so steadfastly to the staff. Um, and, you know, we're all trying to figure it out as we go along. I know that people have questions that are um, super detailed, like the two previous parents. Um, I'm getting questions like that, obviously, in my inbox as well. And I just want to, I want everyone to take a collective breath and understand that um, the information is going very rapidly. And so what we know now is maybe not what we're going to know in two weeks. And um, I really hope that people have their sort of flexibility and adjustment um, compasses well, um, well tuned. Do you tune a compass? No, I don't think you tune a compass, but just well, um, well magnetized for this moment. Um, so I just really, all this is, is an appreciation, a huge thank you um, to the work you've done so far, to the, um, and to the amount of stress that you've probably been carrying and holding yourselves. Um, and I just want you to know that we are all in this with you guys. <clears throat> the staff is super on board. We are um, a team and we are uh, in it together. So I just wanted to, um, oh, and also I'm a teacher at Berkeley High. I didn't say that part. I'm a, <laughs> sorry, teacher leader of the universal ninth grade, um, ethics study social living teacher who um, is also the parent of a ninth grader. So I wear a lot of hats. Um, thanks you guys, we'll be listening. Thank you, Hasmig. So I see no other request, no other people raising their hand to speak. Oh, wait. Oh, that, that is Um, So if there's anybody else, this is your last chance. Well, this is your last chance for now, although you will have a chance 
at the end, which I think should be at 10 or before 10. Um, seeing nobody, um, next is the ch opportunity for the board members to say a few words. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and call on you and we're just going to do it that way. So I'm going to start with Director Sinai. Good evening. Um, I too want to express my sincere appreciation to President Appel and to Superintendent Stevens for all of the work that you guys have been doing over the last few weeks with all of the cabinet and our labor partners because I, you know I work in healthcare and so I know what it's like to have this completely absorb your life. We we say now that we can't even remember life before COVID. Um, and so, uh, again, a, a sincere appreciation and also sincere appreciation to all of the families of BUSD for the patients that um, you have held. This, this is a complete recalibration of public education. And um, it's only been a week and a half, I think. Um, seems like somebody said, you know, how much of um, a year has gone by in the last week. And um, there's so much to do. I look forward to tonight's presentation. Um, I actually am kind of I, I, I'm spending my life on Zoom. So it's bittersweet to see the school board on Zoom. Um, but I'm so glad we have this technology to be able to continue to meet and to do the, the important work that the district requires. So um, I think that's, that's where I'll leave it tonight with a sincere appreciation for everybody at all levels um, for the valiant effort people are making, those who are staying home with their kids and trying to juggle their work and become home educators to uh, the people who are developing the curriculum. So thank you. Thank you, Director Sinai. Um, I'm gonna call on you, Director Brown. We don't see your face anymore. There you are. You're muted, Director Brown. You're muted. There you go. Better? Yeah. Okay. Um, first, I'd just like to say thank you to all of those who've joined us tonight um, during the Zoom board meeting. And um, I want to echo Julie's sentiments. I'm really thankful to our district, to Superintendent um, Stevens, to Jay, and also to President Appel for setting this up and ensuring that we have a platform to do um, the necessary work that we, that we still need to do. Um, I'd like to dedicate my comment time um, tonight to our teachers. And so first, I'd like to say thank you to our teachers. Um, despite this scary and super unfamiliar time, many of you um, are being the heroes that we need. And by that, I mean many of you are going above and beyond to make contact with your students, to send an email, to provide them um, with work, um, and to provide them with some type of uh, support for distance learning. And after the May 1st announcement um, today, I share some of your sentiments knowing that the, we have a, a long road ahead of us, but through it all, um, you're maintaining the idea that our students should always come first. And so I'm very thankful for that. I'm also thankful to um, Super Superintendent Stevens who has worked extremely hard and consulted with BFT members, consulted with um, administrators and principals to come up with our district's uh, distance learning plan and that'll be shared uh, this evening. So help is on the way, but for our teachers um, who, are, who are doing something, thank you so much for closing the gap and for always prioritizing the needs of our students. So thank you. Thank you, Director Brown. I'm going to call on Student Director Hemp. Do you have any comments? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I don't want to take up too much time, but there are quite a few things that I wanted to say just while, you know, we all have a time, I mean, an opportunity to see each other. It, it seems like our last meeting was months ago. It's, it's honestly um, pretty insane how the time has been passed the past few days. Um, I first wanted to start my comments on just acknowledging my grade. Um, I'm a senior right now at Berkeley High, which it's it's a it's hard on us. Um, a lot of people are really sad, but um, 
as much as I want to acknowledge that it all it is also super important to um you know be looking out for the older folks in our community right now um and those who are at risk in other ways such as those who have um immunocompromises and you know such stuff like that and so I just really wanted to um speak on that for a second because it's been something that um we've been talking about in many of my circles in my life whether it's been like my class zoom sessions or just talking to my friends on the phone um i wanted to say you know thank you to the healthcare workers and the emergency responders the grocery store employees mailmen waste management folks just people who are still working through this time um it's it's just insane that there are people who go to work every single day and you know like risk their health so that our um city can stay alive and awake and moving um i wanted to say thanks to the the board and um really really miss schwang too i know that someone spoke on that earlier Ms. nasi and thank you but um i spoke to miss schwang actually I, I think it may have been on that Thursday or it was Wednesday. No, it was, it was, it was Thursday, um, the last day of school. And she really just made me feel so grounded and um, just so comfortable to like talk about all this stuff. And she's just an amazing principal. We're so lucky to have her. And um, Dr. Stevens, oh my goodness, you really came in during an insane year. <laughs> and there has been so much on your plate since the second that you walked through the door. It's, it's wild, but it's, it's so, so appreciated. Um, and the teachers who are, you know, staying in touch with their students right now and really, really working hard to like actually reach out is, is super, super valuable. Um, I'm in, I'm in CAST, the small learning community, and they made an Instagram to stay in touch with us. And it is the cutest thing in the whole world. It's so funny. And I know that some, some AHA teachers did that as well. And it was just, it was a small act, but just so, so appreciated. And I just wanted to say, like, finally, um, this time has really brought forth a lot of like self-reflection and um i think a lot of people are experiencing that and just me personally i'm really starting to see you know just like how how grateful i am to come from the community that i do come from you know berkeley and like busd and then also not only like am i grateful to have come from busd but i'm so grateful to be a part of it right now and to have the people that are in this community to support and to look towards and come together but you know as, as much as we can um and yeah in hard times like this i feel really lucky so that's all i'm going to say tonight um but thank you guys thank you so much for coming and for sharing that with us director hemp because of course um director leva cutler Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for all the, the comments to our staff, to our families, to our, our superintendent. Um, I'm in the child care community. So in terms of I know that our early childhood teachers have been reaching out to the young ones. Um, this has been a struggle because it's, it's um, many of our early childhood teachers want to be there for their children. And so I know everybody's thinking creatively and out of the box and even more so adding to each other's ideas in terms of how can we make sure to reach out to all of our students, uh, our students who are special ed, our youngest, our youngest children who are three-year-olds and four-year-olds. How do we provide a learning opportunity that's not a lot of screen time, which a lot of families try to avoid. So it's been, it's been a, it's almost like a roller coaster ride <laughs> um, that we're all on and um, experiencing together, but we're also very learn, learning um, all of us are learning right now. I'm learning this Zoom. <laughs> um, and so it's a, it's a great opportunity to expand our knowledge, expand our experience and our talents. And together, I think we can get through this. We will get through this. Um, and it, it helps very much to have a community like Berkeley um, that really embraces all of us. And, and I want a special thanks to our certi uh, certified and our classified who are all doing their part every day trying to figure out how to support our students 
and and our families too because our families you know and those teachers who are teaching our students and also have children at the table uh, being taught by their teachers um, kudos to you i know we're all learning some new talents in in terms of not classroom management on screen and also at home um, so you know my my heart goes out to you and i and i wish we could be there for you a little bit more so thank you and i look forward to the presentation today thank you director leva cutler um, vice president alper thanks president Pell. um i'll be brief my colleagues um are very eloquent in their appreciation um for so many of the people as Director Hemp said, who are going to work every day, you know, risking their own health to ensure that the essential services of the district, including nutrition services, are being um, uh, continued. And we're gonna hear tonight about how our instructional services can, um, can continue in this prolonged period that we don't know the, the, the length of. Um, and I know that parents and guardians and students and teachers and staff are anxious to hear about those plans and and as um, President Meyer said, anxious to implement them. Um, so uh, I know we have a lot of there's a lot of questions and a lot of challenges ahead of us. But with President Appel's leadership and Dr. Stevens' leadership and our uh, union partner leadership and all of the cabinet and all of our employees, um, I'm really confident that we will um, be able to meet these challenges. As as others have said, and um, and I think even though it's kind of repetitive, it's helpful in sort of these scary, sort of unsettling times to express that gratitude to the to the people who are doing the work every day, and that's many of the people on this call, um, and including you know, and I'm looking at the numbers, 151 people who have joined us, um, which is you know more than are usually watching on YouTube or at our board meetings. So um, I'm not suggesting that this become the future of our board meetings, but I am gratified that so many people were able to figure out how to um, log in and, and listen and participate. Um, and maybe, usually we don't have a lot of public comment after in the second public comment period, but maybe tonight um, people will be able to stick around and let us hear their thoughts about the presentation, the questions and the discussion that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Alpert. So I'm going to go ahead and give my comments now. And um, so, first of all, I'm not sure. I mean, I know people have, have expressed their gratitude to me. I'm basically just spending time, you know, learning from the administration. And I have to say that um, um, Superintendent Stevens, as well as the Assistant Superintendent, the Associate Superintendent, and everybody um, Natasha Beery, like the people who are working really close, closely with him, they have been working so hard to figure out our next steps. And, you know, at first I was communicating with Superintendent Stevens about, you know, communicating some of the concerns expressed by parents or teachers even. Um, and then what I realized is that what Superintendent Stevens together with Matt Myers and others have done and our principals, have done, which I think is really unique and very that we should be very proud of, is that they're developing an education plan that um, that is equitable, that has equity as its base. So it's not like thinking about oh, what can we do, like when people don't show up for class, or what can we do after. I think they're trying to anticipate a lot of things beforehand. So like last week, we had they had done something. I guess. Um, Principal Schwang had done something or maybe we did as a district and the students responded to a questionnaire and so we gave out um, we lent it we lent computers to students last week at the high school this week at the middle schools and then after spring break on April 6th we'll be we'll be turning to the elementary schools and I just I mean I've talked to teachers in other districts and they're like they're just their students just don't have any way to access any online learning so um, here in Berkeley, we have some people, obviously we have a huge income gap. And so there's some people who, you know, their kids have computers and that's great. And there's some who, um, who need the computers to be able to access um, the lesson plans that are, gonna, that are being put together. And so I wanted to join everyone else in thanking the um, Superintendent Stevens and the rest of 
the folks you've been working with. Um, and I wanted to say that I really think that what you've come up with and what you're coming up with and what the teachers will continue to come up with is really um, will be a model for how to do this with equity front and center. And that's, that's how our district is. And I think those are values we all share. And so I mostly just wanted to, to thank you for, and to recognize that and to thank you for, for um, making sure or trying to make sure that as many of our students are, um, that all of our students are served. So um, if you're a parent listening in and you know, you feel like you, you know, you, you, you're kind of frustrated because there hasn't been, there hasn't been more district-wide guidance. It's coming. That's what Superintendent Stevens is going to talk about. And what's so great about it is that it's going to be accessible, hopefully, to every single student. Um, okay, so um, with that being said, um, I did want to see if any other, we don't usually do this, but I did want to just see if any of the other BUSD staff who are on this call, like the assistant superintendent, the associate superintendent, the public information officer, um, or anybody else would like to say a few words. There's no pressure, but if you do, you can just raise your hand and I'll call on you. Okay, so hearing from none of them, now um, let's turn to the- um, President Appella. Yes? What about Dr. Stevens? Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Stevens. I was so ready to hear you in the next item, but thank you, Ty. And Dr. Stevens, if you want to go ahead and make your comments, that'd be great. Uh, thanks very much, President Appel. I hope everybody's able to hear me. Um, I, I will be uh, making uh, two different presentations a little bit later in the evening, um, one with a fair amount of detail about the developing distance learning plan for Berkeley Unified School District, uh, another more an update to the board about the current status of our uh, budget building process, um, work that we were trying to complete prior to COVID-19 uh, and that we must complete uh, in any case under these circumstances. Um, what I wanted to do is both uh, uh, also express my gratitude to the um, just huge variety of people who are coming forward in the community um, to offer uh, many, many forms of help. That includes um, from inside the district, um, every member of the cabinet team, all of our principals, our central office administrators, um, teachers have been reaching out over and over again with lots of thoughtful ideas and then just stories about the acts of goodwill that they're performing right now. We have lots of folks on the front lines. Um, particularly our nutrition service workers who never skipped a beat. Um, they were out there uh, having modified their entire program with only about 12 hours notice, um, giving out meals on the very first day of our school closures back on Friday, the, uh, March 13th. Uh, and then to all of the families um, who have been um, both tolerating very different circumstances, I um, just want to express our gratitude for um, giving us this patience um, for these few days to try and turn the world uh, right side up again. Um, it truly has just been upended for all of us. And then finally, um, uh, uh, what I'd like to do is just acknowledge the, just the sheer depth of emotion uh, that every single one of us is confronting right now. Um, uh, not a person that I'm speaking to isn't expressing some version of anxiety or fear or frustration or trepidation about um, both what's happening and what we all know uh, could come in our direction uh, in the weeks to come. Um, so I will not be speaking much about the emotions um, as we get into the sort of technical details of the plans shortly, um, but wanting to acknowledge that this is just a moment of anxiety for all of us and that we all appreciate the sense of community that you've proffered our way. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Stevens. I'm sorry, I almost skipped you. Um, but luckily, Ty is keeping me honest. Um, anyhow, so we are now gonna move to our consent items. Um, do, I guess I'll just go ahead and make a motion to, um, to approve the uh, a, a consent calendar. Is there a second? A second. Seconded by Vice President Alper. Um, Ms. Pacheco, would you mind um, taking a roll call? Oh, I don't see. Oh, there you are. Not at all. Director Sinai? Yes. Directora Leva Cutler? Yes. Student Director Hemp? Yes. Director Brown? Yes. Vice President Alper? Yes. President Appel? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to our action items. The first one is what we've all been waiting for. Um, I think um, 
Director Stevens, do you have anyone you're presenting with or you're doing this alone? You're, you're on mute. Sorry, I, I myself am getting used to these new conventions. Um, uh, I may be at times uh, joined by a few folks and that may be mostly in the question and answer session, but I'm planning to do the presentations myself. Great, so let's go to 12.1, district plans related to COVID-19 and distance learning. Great, and I hope you'll bear with me for a moment as I um, share the screen that I'm working with. I'm sorry, I don't have my agenda. Is this the one for student families or teachers and staff? Which one's first? The first one, well, I don't know. He's, this is one agenda item. So I think Brent will leave it, lead us through how he's gonna discuss them. Um, it's one agenda item on the agenda. Yeah, so I um, uh, direct uh, President Appel, I'll first be moving over to a presentation um, on the district's efforts related to uh, coronavirus and then distance learning. And then the second of the two agenda items is uh, proposed adjustments to the budget schedule. You'll bear with me just one moment. And I believe if all is working well, you should be able to uh, now see the presentation. President Appel, does that, does that look right? Yes, that's good, Brent. Great. Uh, so I'm going to jump in. Um, so so uh, what I intend to cover uh, is sort of two topics. Um, a very small portion of this evening's presentation will talk just about the, the recent developments uh, with COVID-19 over the last five days or so since we last offered an update to the Board of Education just last Thursday. Uh, the majority of the presentation uh, will be unpacking a very recently developed plan as it relates to distance learning for the entirety of the district. Um, I should say before I do any of this that many, many educators uh, have reached out to their classes, have begun on their own to offer a variety of distance learning experiences to students. Uh, so this plan is meant to create a more even playing field, both for our educators and all of our families. And so I hope you'll, that you'll, uh, many families will find that um, uh, sort of first order questions are answered in this uh, plan. And then I also want to recognize that for every uh, uh, question that we answer in this plan, there's likely two more uh, that we'll have to resolve as we go along through this together. Um, uh, first, just to um, uh, observe the sort of uh, progression of the outbreak here in the Bay Area. Uh, when we first presented on COVID-19 only two weeks ago, uh, we had observed two cases here in Berkeley. By Thursday of last week, that was three. The number is now 11. Uh, here in Alameda County, that number has um, uh, moved from three to 35 to 124, uh, again, in only a two-week period of time. In California, we've moved from 157 cases to 2,660 cases, from four deaths to 58 deaths. And in the United States, over a two-week period, we've gone from uh, 938 to 9,300 to 6,000 cases. Uh, and there you can see the number of total deaths uh, recorded due to COVID-19 across the country. Uh, all of this is to say that the outbreak is expanding very rapidly. Um, and in some places of the country appears to be doubling uh, roughly every every week. Uh, today's uh, important news. And for can I tell you that um, while we were on this call, I got a um, I got a notice that the U.S. has hit a thousand deaths. Ah, thank you for that information. Uh, these things are changing uh, minute by minute. Um, uh, today, we all received important information from the county health officers of seven Bay Area counties. Um, this includes Alameda County, where we're located. Uh, those county health officers, in collaboration with the county superintendents of education, uh, have made a decision to extend the school closure period uh, through May 1st. Uh, this was consistent with news we heard on Monday from LA Unified. Uh, and is more consistent with several large districts across the country, including Boston, which went out until April 20th, uh, and New York City, uh, uh, which initially called its schools closed until April 27th. Uh, we regret hearing this news. Um, this is all coming as a bit of a shock to us um, and seems to be this week sort of added shock uh, in addition to all the others that we've experienced previously. 
Uh, during the first week of our response, um, uh, at the point that we did not yet know uh, that we might be looking at extended school closures, uh, back on Monday, March 16th was when BUSD was able to put up a, a curated compendium of online educational resources on our website, berkeleyschools.net. Um, within a few days, we were administering a survey uh, to over 600 educators here in the district uh, to try and get an accurate sense of individual teachers' circumstances, their needs, uh, and their uh, uh, best thinking about what distance learning could look like, not only for themselves as individual teachers, but across the span of our district. Uh, and then a lot of our work has had to do with uh, analyzing daily and often hourly updates from a variety of organizations. Uh, that includes the federal government, the state, the county ed, uh, office of education, our colleagues in the Department of Public Health, um, as well as a whole variety of professional and legal organizations uh, that are offering not comprehensive guidance on the entirety of our situation, but oftentimes uh, small piecemeal guidance about an element of the issues that we're experiencing. So with that, I'm going to turn into an uh, explanation of Berkeley's distance learning plan. Uh, for folks who uh, have uh, checked out the online agenda, there are two documents available. Uh, one is the slide deck that I'll be reviewing. Uh, there's also a 12-page printed version of this same plan. Uh, and we will be distributing this plan broadly to the community uh, in the morning. Uh, and then we'll also be speaking with press and speaking with lots of members of our own staff about the elements of this plan. Uh, because you're seeing it here this evening does not mean that all 1,500 uh, employees in Berkeley Unified have yet seen it. And so we've got a, a fairly complicated communication challenge in front of us, not only to distribute it, uh, but to ensure our employees uh, uh, in a coherent way uh, understand the elements of the plan. So I'm uh, in the presentation, we'll be addressing seven components uh, that are described in written form in this plan. Uh, they include an overview of the feedback that we received last week from our educators, which proved to be value in thinking about the overall design of a district-wide plan. I'll talk briefly about what we're doing now to uh, ensure access to technology for our students and families. Uh, then uh, we'll go into probably the area of most interest uh, for families and staff. These are the elements of our distance learning supports. Um, uh, this will include uh, particular attention to uh, equity supports for English language learners and students with disabilities. Uh, we'll also talk about the role of a number of our ancillary staff members in implementing the plan. Uh, we've done some preliminary thinking as well about how we'll monitor student participation in distance learning, uh, some preliminary thinking as well about grading course credit and graduation to questions earlier in the, in the uh, evening, uh, professional development supports for teachers, uh, and then finally talk briefly about the roles we conceive of for teachers, teacher leaders, school administrators, and central office employees. Um, uh, we did receive um, over 600 responses back within about a 24-hour period from our educators. Um, they proved to be very instructive in understanding the circumstances that our education educators are now facing. Um, uh, no surprise, they turn out to be very similar to the same circumstances that parents are facing. Uh, about 60% of our teachers reported that because of the rushed closure of schools that they were uh, without access or had limited access to the planning materials that they say they need to be able to sustain education from their homes. 40% now report that they're in caregiving situations that will substantially limit uh, their ability to participate in distance learning experiences. Uh, and then when viewed as a whole, our K-12 teachers uh, seem to point to several design features of the district plan that we have tried to build upon. Uh, that includes the distribution of electronic resources to students through Google Classroom. Uh, their uh, teachers uh, responded very favorably to the idea of the district. Uh, curating curriculum resources centrally and sending them out to teachers uh, so that not every individual teacher was responsible for creating digital content for their classes. Uh, they also responded favorably to weekly assignments as opposed to daily or hourly assignments uh, and then wanted to take advantage of the free broad library of electronic resources that we have both found and continue to find. Uh, this slide speaks to the efforts that we're making right now to distribute technology across our district. Uh, we've established three uh, unique mechanisms by which a family or student can request um, a loaner Chromebook. Uh, that includes sending an email. Uh, folks can use their phone to do this. Uh, we've also established a Chromebook hotline. That number is 510-644-8931. Uh, we've got a regular set of volunteers uh, checking that uh, hotline every single day. 
uh, uh, families can also fill out an e-form uh, on berkeleyschools.net slash connecting. Uh, that as well can be completed on your phone. You don't need a computer to do that. You can see as well to the left on the screen the distribution schedule that we are um, have established and are keeping. Uh, that includes starting with our secondary students at Berkeley High, BTA, and BIS. Uh, we continue those distributions. We've moved now into middle school distributions at King, Willard, and Longfellow. Uh, and then because of the extent of the distribution process, um, we're contemplating moving to elementary schools after spring break. Um, uh, we had wanted to accelerate our elementary distribution, uh, but recognized that given uh, both the quantity of computers needed at that level um, and the, just the technical de details of dismantling carts and cataloging our, our Chromebooks, we simply weren't better, able to do better. Um, we also recognize that some teachers are in need of a Chromebook, and so uh, we've included here on the slide ways that uh, uh, teachers uh, can access one. Uh, that includes submitting a help desk ticket or just speaking with your principal. Uh, so now to jump into the elements of the district learning plan, uh, what we plan to do uh, is bring together uh, small teams of uh, teacher volunteers. Um, essentially, we're calling them distance learning le uh, uh, lead teachers, uh, whose job each week will be to curate weekly sets of educational activities for each grade level or for each key course in the district. Uh, we're contemplating doing this at the pre-k level through elementary and middle school uh, and then as students get into the secondary grades from six all the way through 12 uh, these teams will be working to curate course content not grade level content so by that i mean common math courses common spanish courses common english language arts courses um, uh, we have some guidance about how many hours per week of activity we like to see at each of these grade levels um, no one would be surprised to learn uh, that uh, the hours per week increase uh, as students get older and become more capable of independent work. Uh, I'll go through some of those details. So at the uh, pre-K level, um, what we can uh, see uh, is that the, uh, we're uh, just now uh, uh, putting together some preliminary guidance about what these uh, distance learning activity sets might look like. Um, uh, we imagine that they will include some key learning objectives uh, written in uh, human being language, not, not educator speak, but a language that's accessible to parents and students. Uh, recommendations for a weekly schedule uh, for distance learning, things that lots of parents have been eager to see. Uh, suggestions about how students and parents can connect those learning objectives to uh, thoughtfully chosen online learning activities that are available through our website. Uh, they'll also include specific lessons in a variety of subject areas um, with readings and writing materials. And then we also imagine that it would be helpful if our education teams are suggesting activities that are possible at home uh, that might include simple experiments uh, using common household projects, things like cooking and measuring, uh, or getting outside for a little bit of moderate physical exercise. Uh, here you can see um, our preliminary thinking about the number of hours per week um, that these activities uh, could include. Um, and remember, we're talking about a mix of both digital and analog activities. Um, so we're right now contemplating about four to six hours per week of work for PK and TK for our youngest students, three and four years old. Um, uh, it's about 10 hours a week for students in kindergarten and first grade, 12 to 15 for second and third grade, and then up to 15 hours per week of independent work uh, in grades four and five. Uh, at the secondary level, of course, this starts to look a little bit different. Our distance learning teacher leaders will be curating content in four subject areas, particularly those core academic areas. Um, we also hope then that they will be able to supplement those materials mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, create some assignments for courses like world languages, physical education, and the arts. We don't want to leave out our elective classes. Um, uh, folks should expect, though, that uh, we'll have to get better at this work as we go along. Uh, this is the first time as a district we're attempting to curate curriculum on a week-by-week -week basis for every teacher in the district. Uh, and then finally, um, uh, we'd like these teams as well to be uh, creating project suggestions that can be completed individual or with other students um, through an online medium. At the secondary level, we're imagining approximately three to four hours per class per week. Uh, so for a student who's carrying six classes, um, you could imagine that's something like 18 to 24 hours of independent work per week. Um, we uh, set that uh, there, uh, thinking that most of this work will be somewhat independent. Uh, and for the average learner, this may feel a lot like homework. And so to have more than three or four hours of independent work per day may feel taxing to a young person. 
Um, I'll then move on to the second element of the distance learning plan, uh, and that is the role of the teacher. So I just described having a central set of distance learning teacher leaders curating uh, curriculum. Um, those uh, uh, teams will be sending out these distance learning activity sets each week uh, to teachers across the district. Um, so this is in response directly to feedback we got from teachers that not every individual uh, is in a position to digitize a week's worth of learning experiences for students. So teachers will get these, uh, these packets, these electronic packets, uh, and then uh, turn them around to their classes of students. Um, uh, teachers have the option of using uh, both Google Classroom and for folks who need to learn Google Classroom uh, can begin sending out these materials by email to the families that they're serving. Uh, teachers then are encouraged to supplement uh, the weekly package that they're getting from the district. And so we're imagining that they may do in a number of ways that are already consistent with what teachers do currently. Uh, and that includes um, uh, supplemental recommendations for reading, writing, or projects. Uh, the teacher may decide to record some videos or screencasts with tips or suggestions. Uh, teacher can provide feedback, uh, may live stream whole class meetings or lessons. Many teachers are trying that now. Um, uh, may try some facilitated approaches to virtual, uh, to uh, encouraging virtual student interaction. Uh, and then it's at this level um, that we imagine teachers being able to take these packets and make modifications for students who are enrolled in the TWI uh, programs at both Sylvia Mendez and at Longfellow. Um, uh, the third element of the uh, distance learning plan then consists of uh, direct interactions between teachers and their classes of students. Um, we're conceiving of this right now as uh, office hours, quote unquote. Um, the reason we are calling it office hours is that there's just simply so much variation across our grades, schools, and courses. Um, that by uh, determining this office hours, uh, we're leaving lots of latitude uh, to define the kind of interaction that can take place between the, the individual educator and their students. So we imagine uh, that this will be scheduled by the teacher in consultation with his or her class. Uh, and that included in the office hours may be individual check-in time, uh, maybe class meetings, maybe questions from, multiple, uh, from small groups of students, uh, and any other guidance that the teachers feel is necessary uh, to be able to support learning from home during this time. Um, uh, yep, I'm sorry, that's a, a duplicative. Um, so what I'll do now is talk a little bit about the supplemental uh, distance learning supports. Um, so uh, what we want is that all students um, across the district uh, get this base level of support from the district and the teachers. And then we imagine that the um, uh, teams of teachers who are specific to the support of a variety of student groups uh, will be supplementing in addition to what teachers are offering. So for English language development, uh, all of our schools uh, have English language development teachers. Um, we'll expect those teachers to maintain their current caseload. Uh, and on top of all of the things that ELs will be getting in the components that I pr uh, previously mentioned, uh, we're also anticipating uh, that uh, EL teachers, or sorry, ELD teachers, uh, will be able to uh, continue English language development for students in supplementary ways. Uh, we'll leave it largely to those ELD teachers to craft what that should look like, but we imagine that this is on top of uh, the base level support that they're receiving from classroom teachers. Uh, with respect to special education, uh, the written plan is actually far more detailed than the slides. Um, there's just so much information about the particular um, uh, individual employees in special ed uh, that we didn't dare try to explain it all this evening. Uh, so similar to ELD teachers, uh, special education teachers will attempt to provide supplemental services to students on their caseload. Uh, this is above and beyond the base level instruction that they're receiving through the district learning packets and through their own uh, teachers. Um, we also encourage our special education teachers um, to be thinking about the goals that are um, uh, inscribed in each one of the individual education plans of the students that they are teaching, uh, and then think about modifications given the technology available to attempt to meet those goals. Uh, there is no doubt that this is one of the most complicated aspects of trying to move a brick and mortar educational experience into the ether. Um, as, as, uh, to talk a little bit about what we think special education teachers and case managers will be doing, um, we can see additional support through Google Classroom in, in the form of tips, in the form of additional assignments or modified assignments. Uh, we can envision electronic chats um, or even hangouts. Um, emails and phone calls to parents and guardians will support students to access work. 
uh, live online instruction through Zoom or Google Meet, uh, and then any other instructional strategies adapted from the classroom that a teacher feels are appropriately used in this current setting. Um, we do want to recognize that uh, given that there's no physical interaction between teachers and students during the shelter in place order for however long that lasts, um, that this will be a facsimile of the support that students receive through special education and that some of those services simply can't be replicated in an online environment. Um, we imagine our reading intervention teachers, um, those are, uh, we call them the RTI teachers and our lit coaches, um, will themselves be responsible for keeping track of their current caseloads. Uh, and we'll also take advantage of um, uh, digital resources um, to support student learning. So those can include as, uh, as well small group assignments through digital platforms like Classroom. Uh, and then they may also involve customized playlists for students using resources like Khan Academy or Freckle. Um, our Fast Track Phonics program also has a number of digital resources that can either be pushed out or scanned and distributed. Uh, and then we encourage those folks to learn how to use Zoom appointments for small group instruction as well. Uh, also uh, supplemental to this whole plan is the Office of Family Engagement and Equity. Uh, we imagined that the OFI team will be working closely with our school principals to monitor participation in district learning. Um, uh, that essentially, we'll be asking our OFI liaisons to take on a case management approach, uh, to be working very directly to understand the data about who is participating and not, uh, and then to coordinate with the school in order to draw in students to the distance learning and try to resolve any problems that might be preventing access for families. Uh, the same is basically true about academic and intervention counseling, uh, where we do have counselors, we expect that they will be managing a caseload, uh, and particularly coordinating with school principals where we're uh, discovering that there are problems with family or student access to technology, uh, or where students' participation in distance learning begins to lag. <laughs> Uh, I should say, on the, uh, uh, to go back quickly to uh, counseling, um, we've done a fair amount of research um, to try and uh, investigate the HIPAA compatibility of a number of online platforms so that counseling, uh, actually uh, an individual emotional well-being counseling can take place. Uh, we feel that we've got most of these um, uh, issues resolved and uh, we'll be providing much more detailed gu guidance to our counselors about exactly how to do that. Uh, we do plan to monitor student participation. Uh, the state at this point has not offered us guidance about what type of attendance should be required. Um, they are making very clear that uh, ADA funding, the average daily attendance funding, will be available to all California districts through the full closure period, but they haven't specified what reporting mechanism they're expecting of us. Uh, currently, absent any other guidance, we'll plan to do a number of things, which includes um, uh, tracking participation uh, in the twice per week office hours, uh, and then roughly logging uh, a student's completion of work as it's assigned by teachers. Uh, we'll collect all of this centrally through our BREA department. Um, we are committed to ongoing feedback, both from educators and from families. Um, uh, uh, in the same way that we were able to use data from the large scale um, teacher survey that we collected, we plan to do that once we launch this plan on April 6. Uh, and then we're committed as well to maintaining all of our current channels of communication uh, with families. Uh, and we'll also uh, create a survey instrument to try and gauge how successful we're being after a week of implementation. Uh, we are struggling uh, in the lack of uh, guidance uh, from the state about how to handle grading and four credit assignments and graduation. Um, whatever decision we make ultimately as a district, we hope will um, conform uh, to decisions made with, by the California Department of Education and ultimately by our institutes of higher education. Uh, what we don't want is that any Berkeley student would be penalized for decisions we make locally uh, that could jeopardize their chances of attending um, college after high school. What we have done so far is extend the third quarter grading period. Um, the old date was the 27th of March. The new date uh, is the 10th of, of April. Uh, this gives, we feel, a, a fair and more expansive window for students to submit late work. Uh, and also accounts for the fact that we've been closed for a while and simply haven't been able to uh, finish our grading. For quarter four, um, we're taking cues potentially from UC Berkeley. Um, they've decided to move the entire university over to a pass-no-pass no pass grading scheme uh, through the rest of their semester. 
Um, if we did that, then we would have a, a little bit of math work to do to figure out how to blend third quarter um, uh, letter grades uh, into a pass, no pass system. And then we're really wrestling with the equity issues associated with potentially assigning a no pass grade um, to students who might legitimately have had access issues through the period of the school closures. Uh, in terms of graduation, we are still waiting for guidance from the state. Um, our commitment, um, our moral commitment, is that no student will be penalized um, uh, for all of these, uh, for the incidents that are taking place now around the country. Um, so uh, we have not yet um, issued firm guidance to our schools about what uh, graduation will look like, uh, but continue to wait for the state of California to say something about graduation requirements for all seniors across the entire state. Um, we are planning professional development for teachers. We recognize that this is one of the larger lifts uh, in trying to move a traditional school uh, institution uh, into the internet. Um, so we've got uh, right now plans for four different professional development mechanisms to support our teachers. Um, they include uh, the creation of an overview webinar uh, that we'll ask all of our teachers to take. Um, this is just the sort of uh, best practices as it relates to distance learning uh, and then talks a little bit about issues like confidentiality, appropriateness, monitoring student participation. Uh, we're also assembling a list of um, uh, resources about um, technology platforms for our educators. Uh, there's a rich standing set of online professional development webinars that our uh, teachers can begin to take right away. Uh, those include uh, decent tutorials about Google Classroom, Google Meet, how to use Zoom. Um, so uh, even independent of being in touch with us, uh, we encourage our teachers to begin to explore these resources and these platforms. Um, our Digitech team will also be uh, creating technology office hours for teachers to be able to call in and pick up pointers. And then for folks who really need the added one-to-one -one support, uh, we'll also commit to providing technology coaching from our uh, Digitech team. Uh, that team is currently uh, five TSAs. Uh, so it's certainly outnumbered by the sheer number of educators. And we definitely encourage educators to call colleagues who are tech savvy and begin to pick up these skills themselves. Uh, as I finish this up, um, I would like to reiterate um, to the Berkeley community and to the Board of Education uh, that we're committed to getting feedback on this plan and to getting better. Um, nobody has done this before. Um, this is absolutely a revolutionary sea change for schools and we're trying to do it in about five work days. Um, so uh, we will get better at this, but please uh, Berkeley community be patient with us. Um, no doubt as we try this for the first time, there's going to be lots of wrinkles to iron out. Uh, and we'll do that as quickly and conscientiously as we possibly can. Uh, we do want to acknowledge that the overall impact uh, on our families and staff of, of, of upended lives as a result of the national response to COVID-19. Uh, in addition to all the work we have to do, we also have to manage the emotional impact of the, of the outbreak. Uh, and then please know that BUSD is going to do absolutely everything we can uh, to support our community uh, through this very difficult period of time. So thank you very much. That uh, is the end of the presentation and I'm looking forward to taking questions from board members. Director, um, uh, President Board Paul, President, you are, you're yeah, here. no, I know, I couldn't, I couldn't, sorry. Can, I you, can my, you tell us how you would like to move through yeah. this? Um, so what I'd like to do is um, ask people, oh my goodness, um, ask people to, to not, excuse me, put questions in the question and answer um, function, please, because we, you know, you'll have a chance for, um, extended comment at the end. Um, although I'm assuming that Superintendent Stevens also has access to that Q&A and can answer those if he sees fit. Um, or I'm hoping someone will answer them. Um, and the, um, since, you know, people have sent them in. And then as far as board members participation, what I'd like to do is do the same thing that I asked of the, um, uh, the participants, um, if you can, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to close this. If you can, it would be great if you can just raise your hand. Um, I see me, I'm gonna take me off. Um, and then um, I have Vice President Alper and um, Director Sinai. And so then if other people- Just remind me, where's the, where's the hand raising? Oh, it's at the, so at the, um, so if you if you click on the participants, it says participants 167. 
if you click on that and then go to the panelists, the panelists are all of the people who are on the board here. And, um, and then if you, if you raise your hand, I can see it. So if you raise your hand right now, see there's a raise hand button at the bottom? Oh, that you did it. Okay, so that's how we're gonna do this and we'll see how it goes. I mean, you know. Uh, okay, so Vice President Ty Alper. Thanks, and um, President Appel, uh, I, I imagine a number of us have a number of questions. Do you want us to sort of ask one and then go to another board member? Um, why don't we do that? And if you still have a question, you can keep your hand up. Okay. Um, so thanks, Dr. Stevens. Where is he? Oh, there he is. Um, thank you for that. And, and to all the people who have put in so much work into that. When, when Director Sinai said earlier that it's been a week and a half, I thought, well, that I literally thought that that must be wrong. And I, and I looked at my calendar and realized that it's not. That to, so um, given all the legal challenges, technology, practical, um, challenges involved in putting together a plan that we weren't expecting to have to do so quickly is really um, sort of a momentous uh, a mom, uh, a, a, a accomplishment. Um, I, if can you go to the is it can we ask you to share a slide, Dr. Yes. Stevens? Um, can you go back to the one that talks about the hours um, that each of these activity. Uh, let's see. Unshare your screen until you figure it out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Director Alper. Well, okay. So my question is: so to so you know, one thing that I know so many families in our community have experienced over the last week and a half, which has given them, I think, a great appreciation for what our teachers and and classified staff do every day, um, is they found themselves trying to homeschool their kids. Um, without any uh, training and with limited, with the limited, helpful but still limited resources that the district was able to put together. Um, and I think one question that I'm not totally clear on, um, even if the details aren't set yet, but what the vision is for um, at each grade level or elementary and then middle school and high school, when you talk, uh, how many, I think families want to know how many hours out of the day is someone else going to be teaching my kid? Mm -hmm. And how many hours am I responsible for doing that uh, with whatever resources you're going to give me? And it seems like the, the there's two 90-minute office hours. So that's three hours a week of office hours. So that seems like three hours a week. Um, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. This is a question. Am I right? The th three hours a week. K-12, the expectation is that your kid will be in front of a computer with a live teacher doing some kind of synchronous learning or educational or some kind of experience. And then on top of that, there are, what I, did, what I didn't know, know was what you meant by lessons. Um, are the lessons synchronous video lessons with a teacher or are they, um, you know, pre-recorded videos, or are they written materials? And is that, and I, and I assume that's on top of the three hours a day. So, so in general, I guess that's kind of my question is, can you yeah, say a little I, bit more about all that? You're, you're describing it correctly. So the, um, the sort of uh, live mm -hmm. uh, sort of interpersonal interaction between teachers and families is contemplated as, as those two 90 hour office hours. Now, obviously, many educators will, will exceed that, um, but we're thinking about this as the baseline across all of our, um, all of our classrooms. Um, and then on top of that, um, there would be interaction between teachers and families as uh, teachers are sending out these assignments. Uh, interactions taking place through Google Classroom as students are looking to make sense of those things. Uh, for students who are receiving supplemental services like English language learners, students with disabilities, uh, there would also be supplemental interaction on top of those things. And then uh, many of the activity sets um, we contemplate also including not synchronous videos, uh, but videos that teachers uh, will, that these centralized teacher teams will record uh, that could include tips and lessons that can be watched not in a synchronous environment. This would be asynchronous, essentially static videos. Uh, and then tips for te uh, students to also be able to work independently through a variety of online resources. Um, so so uh, these things are all cumulative. 
Um, and I hope I'm answering the question. It obviously will depend a great deal um, depending on the age of the student. Uh, but we imagine that all of these will add up, uh, not to a complete six hour school day. Um, we realize that that is simply beyond our means to provide, uh, but uh, uh, conceivably uh, many hours per day of work that students will be doing either independently or with guidance of the teacher. Okay, thank you. You're, 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 you're muted, you, President Appel. Sorry, um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask Director Sinai um, to go ahead and ask one of your probably several questions. <laughs> I, I have three questions, but I'll just ask one. <laughs> um, so, and this is kind of combined just um, Dr. Stevens, we, we do a lot of behavioral health Mm -hmm. through Zoom, and Zoom is HIPAA compliant. So that has been an extremely positive tool. Yes. My question is around special ed um, mm -hmm. and the issues around um, the case management. And um, the slide that was presented or in your presentation earlier around the percentage of teachers and or staff who are also out due to their own personal childcare needs and with the, you know, we're all preparing for a potential surge. Um, wondering what maybe the, the immediate impact is on caseload um, in special ed. And if we're looking at in preparation for you, I think in, I saw somewhere, you know, the large percentage of teachers and staff that might be out as the weeks proceed. Um, what some of the thoughts have been around that. So um, I, we're not yet to the point of understanding sort of on an educator by educator basis, the impact on case management um, of, of our teachers' current family situations. Um, no doubt it's the case that um, uh, some of our special educators as well have limited um, capacity during the day. Um, uh, uh, we did though, however, in sort of crafting this plan, try to account for some of those limitations and think we've settled upon some reasonable expectations, both for special educators and general educators. Um, we are quite worried about the fact that most folks, uh, most health experts are predicting that something like uh, 50 to 60% of us uh, will get COVID-19, uh, will very likely become sick from it and, and not be able to work uh, even remotely. Uh, we don't have substitute teachers um, in this particular setting, uh, not any ways that we could be able to step in uh, and play the role uh, in the same way that a classroom teacher would be able to. So we've got a lot of thinking to do about that right now. We're um, begging for patience, um, and it may be the case that we begin to experience these impacts, the impact of illness. Uh, and its um, effect on the services that we can provide. I suspect there's actually many sectors of the society that are gonna be impacted by, um, by ill workforce. Great, um, so now I am going to call on Director Leva Cutler. Thank you, um, <clears throat> thank you for the detail. Um, I know a lot of this and it's a lot of information and um, this is a suggestion. There's some um, terms that you're using that I'm not, I don't even, I don't know, like synchronized video, static video. I sort of think I know, but it's, I think for families, it would help to know what my, my child is learning <laughs> and how, what, what's the, the, the learning vehicle that they, they, are, they are experiencing. So it's sort of, my, my question is sort of piggybacking, I think on, on Julie's and um, in terms of, um, access of the students, um, both in the elementary and, in, and mostly in the elementary, I think, um, in terms of how, how, what does a day look like for a student who is in the elementary, and what could a parent expect um, their child to be experiencing to having a little bit more of an outline of a look of what it could look like. It could be plan A, B, and C, but it should look like this for your child as an elementary student. So I wonder if that's something that would be um, created for families to, to have. Um, and then I'm gonna squeeze in another <laughs> question. An organizational chart for each school in terms of who's doing what, at, so a parent would know and who to go to. Um, because it's a new world now for families. And so 
who do I go to if my child's not sitting down in front of the computer? And I don't know what their schedule is. My kid knows, but she won't tell me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how do we make sure that that kind of communication happens, that parents know and have some idea, especially because this is the first time uh, for some parents that we're actually sitting and helping our child with um, learning a computer and they're learning it together sometimes. Sometimes yeah. the student knows more than the parent too, of course. In my, in my experience, that's almost always the case. Uh, that's true in my house, at least. Yeah. Um, uh, so your first question is just uh, some of the terms that I'm using. So, so this idea of uh, synchronous learning, uh, essentially we're engaged right now in a synchronous, synchronous video conference. Um, we're able to talk to one another, respond to each other in real time. And so we have built that into the plan. These office hours are conceived of as the opportunity to work synchronously, uh, teachers and students together. Um, we also, though, know that um, teachers can't be available for six hours, nor can students tolerate um, six hours per day of looking into a computer screen. Um, and so when I talk about videos that are asynchronous, um, these are videos that would be recorded either by the teacher leader teams uh, and made available as links on a drive. Uh, essentially, a student could be in Google Classroom, click on a link and pull up a lesson. Uh, that might have been recorded by a teacher working centrally. And then teachers, I suspect, are going to begin to record their own videos so that they can be viewed when they're convenient for, for students, uh, but, but not sort of only exist as a single point in time. So I imagine that there will be uh, sort of multiple mediums going on. Again, there's, um, we've got a training gap here. Uh, lots of teachers will need to learn how to do these things. Um, I also imagine uh, a bit to the, an earlier point that as teachers record uh, more and more videos as they make more digitized content, um, that sharing between teachers on teams, even sharing across schools is just gonna be far more common. Uh, and so one of the things we haven't thought about yet, but that stands as an opportunity is how to capture a lot of the independent uh, digital work that teachers are creating and make sure that we're cataloging it uh, and creating additional resource banks for teachers to be able to access smart ideas coming from colleagues, even in other schools. Um, so those are, um, and then uh, I, maybe you could remind me of a couple of the other questions. Oh, uh, the, the daily schedule. Um, so so uh, uh, Director Alper was asking about the, the office hours. So uh, families should think that there's going to be, um, you know, at least two opportunities per week to be plugged in with the teacher very directly. Um, uh, Google Classroom, as we get it up and running, will also be an additional opportunity for families and students to plug in with teachers. Um, this won't be in a video format, but uh, will uh, feel uh, more like a chat uh, that we're all used to online. Um, and then uh, the, the amount of work going on, again, will depend by grade level. Uh, we're roughly thinking that it's in the hour to um, 90 minute range um, per day for students who are quite young, five, six years old. Uh, but then we also want it to include a number of um, uh, sort of suggestions for at home activities, outside activities. Um, families of young students should certainly expect that active parenting will continue to be required. Uh, just like the teachers of young students know that active teaching is required in the classroom. Um, students are just capable of less independent work when they're younger. Active parenting, assumed in students, we're requiring that of our parents. No comment. No comment. No comment. Okay. Uh, so um, I, I, I would hate I would hate for a parent um, uh, to to be right now under the misapprehension that a young student would be seated at a computer for hours per day. Uh, that's not the vision. Right. Um, I was just joking. Um, Director Brown. Yes. Thank you, Superintendent um, Stevens, for your presentation and for all of your hard work on this. Um, I was wondering, well, I have a couple questions, but I was wondering um, if you could go back to the graduation slide, um, or I guess I can just pull it up on my end. Uh, let me see. I, I, I think I can do that. Give me just one moment. Perfect. Okay, so I know that we're waiting um, for for the state for some guidance around graduation. Um, but in addition to that, I'm also concerned about AP testing for our students, um, SAT testing, um, and things of that nature. What messaging are we going to start sending out to families in regards to those super important tests, especially the AP tests that we um, um, 
support. So what messaging are we going to send out to, to parents who are extremely worried about those, those mm -hmm. fake tests? And yeah, I appreciate the question. Um, so we do know right now that the state of California has applied to the federal government for a waiver for all state tests. Um, so that's the large CASP exam. That's all of the, what's called the LPAC, the, the mm -hmm. for English language learners. Um, the College Board has actually um, already begun to communicate to school communities about how they will approach AP testing uh, for this semester. Um, so they're uh, at work right now on a bank of accessible online tutoring videos. Uh, to try and make up for lost instruction for students who are taking AP courses. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they're also advertising that they think they will be able to create a, a test from home uh, version of the AP test that students will be, will be able to take um, using their own computers and from home. So uh, they seem to be um, uh, innovating at this moment. Uh, they're communicating quite actively. And as we get more information from the College Board about AP tests, we'll turn those around. Uh, IB is also another larger national organization that's doing thinking on behalf of all schools about mm -hmm. how to approach the current challenge. Uh, so more information to come about those tests, but those companies seem to be well on their way to resolving some issues. Thank you. Um, so I am going to call on myself next, and then I'm going to go back around to Ty. Um, I have a question, uh, Dr. Stevens, about like the role of the school communities in helping students kind of start learning in this totally new way. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, like every student, every school, kind of every elementary school and middle school, they kind of have their own kind of personality and they know the families really well and they kind of the teachers tend to know their their students families and so I'm wondering if we've built in any way that that school community can be um, how they're going to be kind of a part of this plan yeah uh, I really appreciate the question um, this has been I think one of the the single most frustrating aspects of um, this particular combination of um, challenges we're dealing with uh, we've had no shortage of um, uh, offers of vol for volunteers, uh, folks who want to serve meals, who are offering to help with technology distribution, uh, who are simply interested in supporting uh, families. Uh, because of the shelter in place requirements, because of social distancing, um, we found a, a number of good hearted volunteer efforts um, have simply been denied uh, by local health officials um, just because they would expose folks to additional risk to infection. Um, so we're trying to figure out how to capture um, community spirit and volunteers while also maintaining um, social distancing and essentially the quarantines that we're all living under. Um, we've had some good luck and Berkeley Public Schools Fund is really showing us how to do that. Uh, and then we've had some efforts that have been stymied so far and we're trying to work out how to resolve them. I guess I mean, thank you, that's helpful. I, I think I mean, well, I, I know what I mean, but it's, you know, each like, I don't know, the, um, especially with the elementary schools, you know, um, I'm a little confused how, I mean, the, the teachers in that school and the principal will really know like which students are likely to need, you know, computers and internet access. And, um, you know, if a parent, if a family doesn't have those things, they're not gonna see the email asking for people to sign up for them. So I'm just kind of wondering what the, if you have talked about any plans of how either the family engagement office or the principals or somebody, maybe some aides, I don't know, can, can contact the families who, um, who are not, are most likely not like reading the district emails. I understand your question. That's a good one. What, what we're trying to do is, um, use as many of the existing and effective structures in the school district as we possibly can. Um, so you're absolutely right. Uh, principals will still be principals. Um, uh, all of our um, ancillary support staff is still there to help. So folks like counselors, uh, OP family liaisons, um, we want them doing all of this direct outreach to families and we want families to reach out to them. Uh, ultimately, it will be the principal's job to coordinate the distance learning plan for their school uh, and to resolve all of the problems inside of their school community in the same way that they do it now. Um, we're stepping up as a district to offer a lot of support around uh, the creation of digital learning content 
um, that's the big role that we're going to play, but there's just no substitute for, um, for the communication that can take place between folks who know each other, even if it has to be, you know, through Zoom. Um, and I'm going to actually jump in with another part of that question, which is I, I have been contacted by some people who want to donate either Chromebooks or money. And so if you can put a pitch in for where, how those people should engage. Yeah, uh, we appreciate that. So uh, Berkeley Public Schools Fund right now um, has really stepped up and is occupying the sort of the leadership space for volunteerism. Um, a really remarkable statistic that all of Berkeley should be proud of in the first six days of uh, the school closure period, uh, Berkeley Public Schools Fund raised $100,000 from the Berkeley community uh, that can be then applied directly to families um, in some form of need. Um, so uh, I would encourage folks who want to be involved to just um, check out Berkeley Public Schools Fund's website. Uh, and they've got lots of great details about how to get involved in volunteer efforts during the school closure period. Great. Thank you, um, Superintendent Stevens. And if, you know, if you have a hard time finding the site, make, you know, you, you can feel free to, to email me or I'm sure any of the other board members, except maybe, well, you can email me. I won't speak for the other board members. Okay, so I am going to go back around and call on Vice President Alper. Um, thanks, President Pell. I'm going to um, I'm going to squeeze in one quick question, then then may come. The question is about um, the status of free Wi-Fi in the city, and whether you can talk about um, access not only to the computers but to Wi-Fi, and how we can help families with that, or if you know about. Um, efforts that the city is making on that front. And then um, I, um, I appreciated Director, President Appel's question about the sort of the community and it kind of goes maybe also back to Director Labor Cutler's question about um, the, the, all the questions that families are gonna have and who, who, to, who they go to um, with those questions. And the, I know that the Zoom has this Q and A function that um, probably we should dis disable next time because we're not, it, it's, this isn't a town hall and it's not a way for us to meaningfully respond to questions, but there are a lot of good questions in there that people have. And as this gets rolled out the Monday after spring break, um, the questions that families have are just going to exponentially increase. There'll be all kinds of questions, um, technological questions, but also questions about how to how to do their own teaching, how to access the materials and some of the logistics. Um, and so to me, it seems like principals really do have a big role in that. So I was glad to hear what you said about that, Dr. Stevens. I, it seems to me that principals should be um, communicating, you know, if not daily, you know, very frequently with their families um, as we roll this out um, and making themselves available to answer questions. Um, and perhaps, and then, so, and I don't know if it's, there should be some form for these questions to get answered. Maybe to, maybe that's the answer is the principles, or is it some kind of district town hall where people can actually, you know, go on Zoom and ask questions. What are, what are you thinking about in terms of how we help families navigate all this? Yeah, um, pr probably it's an all of the above approach, Director Alper. Um, the communication challenge that we're facing is simply enormous. Um, the, there's barely a district practice um, right now that doesn't have to be rethought. Um, and, and it is quite literally that almost nothing is working um, with the key exception of our relationships. Um, and I think that that's really the, the sort of place to, to build a plan. Um, we do have to work with our principals to make sure that they understand the plan um, that, that I've just described and they've provided feedback on it, but yet have, haven't yet themselves had a chance to really interrogate it. And then teachers as well will also need that opportunity. Um, we're going to do that as quickly as we can. Uh, but for folks who are viewing this particular discussion tonight, you're now ahead of the curve. Um, you're well ahead of our staff in terms of what you know. Um, we do imagine that we'll have to do things like live um, district-wide town halls. We've probably got a lot of Q&As. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we have to revise sections of the plan on the basis of the way it really works. Um, and then probably having to flesh out sections of the plan with additional guidance um, to answer questions right now that we just can't conceive of because we haven't done this before. That's great. Thank you. And the free Wi-Fi 
Yeah, thanks. Um, um, uh, Jay Nitschke, our director of instructional technology, has um, uh, been far more involved in this. So um, I can sort of speak generally about it. There have been a number of companies that have, have come forward uh, during the school closure crisis offering free Wi-Fi. Um, some of them are indefinite. Some of them, I think, are for a month or two at a time. Uh, all of them do require that uh, potential customers go through the typical scheduling and installation steps, as I understand it. Um, I understand that there have been some discussions at the city level about trying to install hotspots. Um, uh, and there, uh, there, I think we've still got a number of families and even some staff um, who just are lacking access and we've got to help them resolve that. Um, Jay Nitschke, I don't know if you are listening to my response and if you could either modify it or add anything to it. Hi, it's Natasha Beery actually just jumping in because I was involved with some of the um, offers from uh, local internet providers. We, uh, Sonic, which is a local business, offered free internet for um, all families that have K-12 or college uh, students and also for seniors. And uh, Comcast has been offering limited time free for low income families. Thank you, Ms. Beery. Um, I am now going to move to, I'm just going to go down the list, um, to Director Sinai. Did you have an additional question? I do. I'm happy to defer and come back to my question so that Student Director Hemp can ask one because I think she popped up but didn't get in the first round. Thank you. I didn't see her. Director Hemp? Yeah, um, actually most of my questions were um, answered in the past few minutes. Um, so you can come back to me as well and continue with the other comments and questions from the board members. But um, thank you so much, Dr. Stevens, for putting this all together and um, answering all these questions as well. And yeah, thank you. Thanks. Well, I do want to do a little time check and let you guys know that we have about five more minutes until we reach the 90 minute um, time that was put on this item. Um, I do think it's really important, so maybe we should spend a little more time, but um, people should just be aware of that. And I do want people to know who have put a, com a question in the Q&A um, function of, of Zoom. You know, we usually do not take, I mean, we never, we don't have public comment during the meeting. So, um, you know, we, some of your questions have been asked by some of us, excuse me, um, but I do want to say that um, I'm, I'm assuming that we will have some way to respond to the questions in the Q&A. And what do you think, Dr. Stevens? Can we put that on the website? Or like, send, I don't know if we have people's emails who, who signed in tonight, because we could also just send them to the people. Uh, uh, in some cases we do. Um, uh, we've got staff reviewing the questions and while we can't provide written answers over the course of tonight's conversation, um, we are keeping track of them and they're very helpful to us. Um, we, Like I said, well, I do imagine that we're going to have a number of Q&A documents that we'll have to put forward just to um, flesh out some of the details that are um, included in the plan. Okay, so that's just to say that we're not going to answer your questions during this call, but they, they are being um, taken into account by the administration and will be answered at some point. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna go to Director Leva Cutler. Oh, I'm sorry, Director Sinai, you didn't get to ask a question. She said she would wait. <laughs> I know, for, for Director Hemp. And for Director Hemp. <laughs> After you, Beatrice. <laughs> Um, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I think I just want to reiterate, I think what Director Brown was asking, I, I, my, I, I'm very concerned about our, well, I'm concerned about all our students, but I'm also very concerned about our juniors because the junior year is such an important year um, with all the various exams. And so I think in addition to monitoring and dogging the College Board and the state, I hope um, we can find a few minutes to also do some advocacy on behalf of our students and families to, you know, the, the one unique aspect of the pandemic is the whole country is in it together. So we're not at a disadvantage over cities all across this country. So, you know, whether it's the school board associations or the um, superintendent associations, we have to really um, support our students and make sure that these 
uh, private testing organizations that play such a huge role in um, influencing student acceptance um, get pressure from us that they have to lighten up on this and all the college system have to really kind of look at their acceptance. So I encourage us to do advocacy around that. My specific question really, it, it, and I'm, I don't know if you answered it with Director or Vice President um, Alper, but it, you talked a lot about the teachers um, and um, we haven't talked very much about the classified staff and we haven't talked very much about Yuba or the Principals Association and kind of where they're fitting in um, the work that we're carrying out this time frame. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, so, so to talk a bit about principles, um, you know, in the early days of last week, um, even before we understood from Governor Newsom that the, this um, school closure period would be extensive, um, our principles were like our teachers sort of waiting for additional guidance. Um, and I think it's fair to say that across the system, everybody was waiting to see what was going to happen. Um, things really began to shift Wednesday and Thursday of last week as we heard Governor Newsom talk as the CDE began to issue guidance about distance learning. Um, State Superintendent Tony Thurmond began to speak about the importance of distance learning. And it was really at that point that we began to mobilize. We got the survey out. We began to engage our teachers. Uh, and that's when the principal engagement began as well about midway through last week as we realized the sea change about to occur. Um, I myself am having a regular every other day phone check with Eva President Janet Levinson. Um, our principals are on daily Zoom calls, um, have been able to see this plan, offer commentary on the plan. Uh, that's true uh, PK all the way up to high school. Um, separately, Bajay Tiar, the Associate Superintendent of uh, Ed Services, is in conversations with Tom Reed, who is the principal at Berkeley Adult School. Um, you'll notice they were not included this evening, but we haven't left them out. Um, we hope as well to be able to restore some version of adult school services, particularly to folks who are pursuing their high school equivalency um, uh, through BAS. So uh, you, uh, our principals and our administrators have been deeply involved, and as you've heard me describe, they'll play key roles in trying to hold this plan together. Um, they're the folks who are going to stand in every gap they find uh, and try to pull together using their best judgment, uh, a plan that will actually work for all of us. Uh, for our classified folks, um, uh, their variety, um, they're playing a variety of roles right now. Um, uh, some, as we've described before, right out there on the front lines, uh, particularly our, our nutrition service workers have been out there preparing meals and serving them every single day. Um, custodians have not yet come into schools, although today, as we opened up schools temporarily for teachers, many of them came back out. Um, they will, however, um, get busy cleaning schools. We've just been a little uncertain about the length of the school closure. And then uh, we do also have a number of groups of um, employees in the classified ranks uh, who have not come back to work yet. So um, we're trying to do some thinking about the role of instructional assistance uh, in this online environment. So we want to engage their union uh, and thoughtful members among them to begin to think about how they can support special education services remotely. Um, but again, this these uh, we're just peeling back a layer at a time, uh, what feels like the largest onion we've ever seen. Okay, thank you, Superintendent Stevens. And I will say that I got my timing wrong and you still have another half an hour. We still have another half an hour on this item. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn to Director Leva Cutler for your next question. Thank you. I think we're all answering really, asking really good questions and the Q&A also has really good questions. Um, you spoke about uh, Director, uh, Superintendent Stevens about possibly having town, town halls um, meetings and I think that there would, that would be a great idea to hold perhaps um, especially for special ed there's a lot of questions that parents have how do we do this how do we do this with for especially for our students who don't have the capacity to be in front of a computer and their needs are different and so how do we address that so I think that that might be a good opportunity to be able to answer a lot of the questions that families and even teachers may be having in our special ed staff. Um, do you know if, I mean, this is that nobody's even spoken about it, but in terms of the leeway that districts will have regarding our LCAP plans and monies and how they're being spent, because obviously everything is different. Um, and in terms of how we can use re making sure that our students, our special population of students are getting served under the LCAP, with this new 
format that we're teaching our students and, and what that might look like. Obviously, this is something that's going to be rolling out, but will districts have that flexibility to re readdress some of the things that we have on our LCAP um, to address this distant learning, which might include, you know, headphones for some students who don't have access to, you know, we have a lot of people in the room, <laughs> in the house, um, things like that. So in terms of the LCAP and um, also our visa funding, that's going to change too in terms of the arts. Students obviously don't have music, but what will happen with that? So there's a lot of pro little things that need to, will ensure, I'm, I'm hoping that the, the, the Department of Education will give districts more flexibility in terms of meeting our students' needs with what funds we do have access to and availability to. Um, and, you know, because I'm particularly concerned about our BTEC students, our independent study students, what happens to CTE, you know, there's so many questions in terms of what happens to these programs during this interim. Yeah, those a lot are all, of questions. Uh, lots of questions. Um, I wish I had all of those answers. I would be sleeping more easily if I ha if I did. Um, uh, we do know that there's efforts um, taking place right now, um, advocacy at the state level uh, by organizations like the uh, AXA, the Association of California School Administrators, um, to create some latitude for districts about timelines. Um, so, for example, the submission of the LCAP plan, which is typically due in June, uh, may be extended. We don't know that for certain, but there's advocacy taking place just to uh, lighten the workload for districts, given the enormity of the new work that we're trying to accomplish. Uh, in terms of budget flexibility, we haven't heard anything from the state. Um, uh, we're not right now concerned about sort of how we're paying for things. We're just committed to paying for them. Um, we are keeping tracks of uh, sort of added expenditures and potential savings. Uh, and we'll obviously have a lot of accounting to do. Um, in the uh, next presentation, we'll talk a little bit about um, trying to bring some initial estimates of those costs and potential savings to the board meeting on April 15th so that uh, board members can be apprised of uh, the financial impact of COVID-19 on the district. Thank you, Superintendent Stevens. Um, Director Brown. Hey again, thanks. Um, I wanted to ask some um, follow-up questions to um, instruction, if that's okay. Um, we've been receiving, um, since we've been on here, a couple, I'm sure, emails from people, other folks have been receiving, but also in the chat. Um, will there be flexibility, so I have two questions. One, will there be flexibility around um, around office hour time, around dividing office hour time. So um, if teachers are providing 90 minutes of office hours, can that be broken up um, by days? And then um, the other question I had about was about the grading system. Mm -hmm. So I saw that we were potentially moving to um, pass, no pass, or there was a, a thought about maybe moving to the pass, no pass. I know that um, another good practice that some other districts are doing um, is in, it is moving instead of a, a quarter system, moving to a semester um, system. Do we see that that may be a good practice um, in Berkeley or what are, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, uh, so those are uh, two really good questions. Um, remind me of the first though, because I'm, I'm, I'm starting to get tired, Director. I'm Brown. sorry. Um, the first question was about flexibility for office hours. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, at that level of specificity, we haven't yet thought about it. My own personal approach is this. What we're trying to do through this plan is create a foundational experience for all of our students. Um, we recognize that lots of teachers have gone, gone above and beyond. Uh, lots of teachers are trying their best and some for a variety of reasons haven't yet been able to start. Uh, this plan represents sort of the foundation, uh, the baseline, so to speak, that teachers and families um, uh, should count on. Uh, what I don't propose to do is sort of centrally dictate how every teacher in the district should implement this plan. Um, I would far rather have teachers approach the plan flexibly, think about how to make the plan work for them. Uh, and then what I don't want to do is turn off innovation or creativity or teachers who, for a variety of reasons, just want to put in the time to support their students. 
Um, and, and so uh, I would say, yes, the answer should be, let's think flexibly about how teachers implement this plan in service of kids. Um, that's how great ideas are born. Um, and then the, the second question, sorry, I need that reminder again. The second question was about the grading policy, um, mm -hmm. the pass, pass, or potentially moving from um, a quarter system to a semester system. Yeah, we, um, it's really the semester two grade um, that counts that's reflected on transcripts. Um, so this quarter three grade that we, um, you know, the, the, the time period that we're extending to permit the submission of late work um, isn't uh, going to show up on students' transcripts anyways. Um, so we're really a pretty semester dominated um, school district. Uh, what we're struggling with, of course, is that um, in, under these circumstances, um, it feels somewhat unfair to grade students um, on assignments when we understand there are all kinds of access uh, issues that are limiting students' ability to participate. Uh, and the same is true for staff members who have an awful lot of uh, new things to learn. Uh, that's the sort of center, center of our dilemma. Um, even if we went to pass, no pass, we've got to ask ourselves how comfortable do we feel not passing a student under these circumstances? Mm -hmm. um, and then how would we calculate a semester grade so that no student is negatively impacted as they apply to a college, let's say. So I would far rather do what everybody else is doing um, and just stick to whatever guidance we get to this from the state about grading rather than trying to make up our own response. Um, and so we're just, we're in a bit of a waiting game on grading right now and we hope to get more words soon. Thanks. I just want to say as the president, because um, this has come up now a couple of times, I think Julie also talked about advocating to the, to the universities, and it's something that I'm happy to look at, uh, but I think we should wait to hear, because, you know, this is like somebody just said, I think that was you, Doc, um, Director Brown, you know, all of the students all over the country are facing the same obstacle, and so they have to figure out how they're going to address it in a fair way. And so I would be happy to advocate for that. And, um, you know, Ta Vice President Alper is very helpful because he works at Cal. Um, but I can, I will follow up with Dr. Stevens after this meeting to figure out like how, you know, Julie to figure out how we can advocate. Because um, I don't, I think I honestly, what I'm coming to believe now is that in some ways we are thinking so much more deeply than many districts are that um, I think we can we can play a positive role in that. So yeah, I appreciate um, it. And we do hear rumors that the California Department of Education will issue some guidance on Friday. So we'll, we'll see if that's true. That's great. Um, okay, um, I'm going to oh, Director Hemp. Do you have any questions? I don't have any questions. I just, now may be a, a good time to voice. I'm just worried that if, um, like if we were to allow the grades up until this point of semester to be the standing grades um, for students moving forward, I can see there being problems with the fact that not everyone can do that whole like makeup work thing that a lot of teachers are offering right now. and. It, it kind of creates an inequity because some students could have gone into the fourth quarter thinking that they could pull up their grades and now they can't and they're um, not and not everyone um, you know like has the chances to um, communicate with their teachers and do that late work. I, I agree with you. There's, um, there's just sort of inherently problems in the situation that we're in. Um, yeah. So we're just, we just don't have a great solution right now. Yeah, no, I totally understand. I just think it's still important to point out. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Director Hemp. Um, I'm going to ask a question that I actually got from the Q&A um, because it's about something that hasn't been discussed. And that is um, for people who are just, who are, for people who are tuning in who are need to register their kids for kindergarten next year, or maybe they've moved here and they need to register their kids for um, you know, a later grade. Um, I, I guess there was till May, till something like May 13th to hand in the registration um, information. So there's a question about like how they can get information about how to register their kids for school next year. And like some of the things that are required, like a dental appointment, or other doctor's appointments, they, they can't actually get done because they can't go see their dentist. So 
Um, I am wondering if the school, if the district has had any chance to evaluate the red and, and maybe make some tweaks to the registration system so that it can work for people during this time of quarantine. That's an excellent question. Um, I admit I have not in the last week um, uh, began to think about this myself. Um, what I will do is check in with our director of enrollment, Francisco Martinez. Um, I don't doubt that he's already thinking about these kinds of modifications and trying to make um, the enrollment process both accessible and fair given the circumstances. Um, what I do encourage folks to do if you've got any questions about enrollment is to reach mm. out to Francisco Martinez directly by email. Um, he is our director of enrollment. Um, I think that you'll find him responsive, um, but he's the right person to talk to and his name is easily accessible on our website as well. Okay, that's great. Um, I'm going to ask you, Brent, or Dr. S Superintendent Stevens, um, if you have the energy for another round of questions or if we should just move on. I mean, it's a lot. I appreciate you asking. Working super hard. I appreciate you asking me that. Um, I, I obviously am here to serve the board, so it's it's really your decision. Okay. Well, I'm going to take that if and just ask my colleagues to just keep that in mind when you're asking the questions, and um, remember that if there's any questions that we have, we can also have them answered at another time. And and if there's anything that we think should be public, we can ask that they be in a communication. That being said, I'm going to go around one more time and start with Vice President Alper. I'm, I'm good. Great. Um, next, I'm going to go to um, Director Sinai. So a couple of quick things. Um, one, this could be a great opportunity to move as much of the student um, enrollment process online you know, getting whatever applications we can. We've got some time to think about how to do that. I wanna just go back to the grading um, and just remind folks, I really support us being very cautious about any, any grading policy, honestly, because again, at, you know, maybe it comes from where I'm on a day-to-day -day basis, but there is going to be a surge of infections, um, which means, Kids don't get hit by it as hard. Um, hopefully that will continue, but parents are gonna be hit and grandparents are gonna be hit. So people's level of attentiveness to their online education over the course of the next week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, is potentially also going to be impacted. So we don't want people's grades impacted by the fact that the family got sick or the family had to self quarantine and, and be in a different circumstance. So it's really a moving target. Um, and I think the more flexibility with as much resource as possible without um, holding the grading policy, um, I think that it, it could potentially become a real uh, challenge. Superintendent Stevens, and I also actually wonder if um, Associate Superintendent Tiara might also want to chime in here. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in and then um, uh, Baje Tiara is uh, welcome to as well. Um, we do recognize, we're under really extraordinary circumstances right now. Um, you know, in the opening days of uh, what appeared to be the outbreak, we were able to um, come to agreement very quickly uh, with our four bargaining units, making adjustments to um, extended medical leave. Um, what we were finding is just that um, a large number of employees were either uh, required to self-quarantine because of potential exposure or choosing to self-quarantine because of uh, a loved one in a high-risk category. Um, rather than have people go without pay, we modified our extended uh, medical leave policy um, so that they would not be penalized financially for making those decisions. We did that because we thought it was the right thing to do. Uh, whatever we do with student attendance moving forward, we want to make sure we're doing the right thing. Uh, and that is providing latitude for students and families given these exceptional circumstances. We don't have a policy for that yet, but the principle I think would be exactly the same, and that is to create flexibility given what we're about to endure. So I'm, I'm assuming that this is something that will come to the board for, you know, to pass policies um, when you have a chance to, to formulate a recommendation. 
uh, when and if it, it seems necessary. You know, we already do have excused medical absences as an example. Um, and so I don't know that we'll have to um, create new board policy um, so much as just insist on uh, empathy. You know, the fact that a student may disappear from view for a week or two. Um, we don't want them to be penalized unfairly under these circumstances because they or a loved one is getting sick. So we'll keep an eye on the, um, the need for revised policy if it turns out to be necessary. Um, but I think uh, the first step is really just sort of um, encouraging empathy among everybody who's working here in the school district for what families are experiencing. Go empathy. Empathy is good. Um, and I think other board members, if you, if things occur to you that you think would be appropriate for like an emergency policy in related to the COVID-19 um, pandemic, uh, maybe you can communicate that with, with, with Superintendent Stevens and myself. Um, okay, so now I'm going to ask, um, I'm, I have two more time for two more questions. So that's Director Leva Cutler, and then we're going to wrap up with Director Brown. Yeah, I, I think my, my concern goes back to two things. One is when, if during this period of time, you mentioned that the teachers got ill, as mentioned, and can't participate, that we don't have a substitute pool to support um, to replace that teacher and which means that I don't you know would it be a hundred in the high school it'd be 150 students potentially I don't know how many they would have but then those students wouldn't have a teacher because they wouldn't have a substitute so what would be our plan of action in that and why is it we def we've had substitutes in before why wouldn't we want to train um, a group um, in this distant learning to be ready in the event that we have we have teachers who will be absent. Yeah, I appreciate the question. Um, part of uh, a very deliberate part of the design that we adopted, you know, these central teams of groups creating curriculum um, had to do with the idea that over time, some educators are going to get sick. Um, having teams that are developing the content centrally lets us um, plan for a bit of redundancy. Um, essentially, that content is still available to students, even if the teacher becomes ill. Uh, we can't do that for every possible course in the district. The high school offers hundreds of courses every semester. Um, what we can, uh, and then uh, uh, teachers are, you know, intended to um, both modify those um, activity sets and then do their office hours. Uh, it may be possible to bring in the sub to do some of that modification of those activity sets or do the office hours. Some of this, remember, though, is going to get pretty specific to teachers themselves and what they're doing in their classrooms. Um, and so I, we just, I, it might be possible, to, um, and we'll look at it again. Um, I do think under these circumstances, working digitally, that having substitutes step in uh, and carry on for teachers may be a bit more challenging than under normal circumstances. Uh, but we will commit to having a look. Thank you. Um, Director Brown? I'm actually okay. Okay. Um, does anyone else raise your hand if you have another pressing question? Because I think we have you know, a little bit more time. Um, Director Leva Cutler? Um, I'm, I'm especially concerned about the students who, are, before we even had um, COVID-19, the students who were truant and not coming to school, what that, are they going to be present in virtual distance learning? Um, it would be wonderful to know that this is probably, this might be their platform for learning um, I'm hopeful, but if not, who will be monitoring and watching that um, in terms of the students that were having this, this cha these challenges of coming to school, are they now having that all equally the challenge in being present for distant learning? Yeah. Um, it's a great question. Um, you know, we all of the same folks who work in the district and who do that work now um, still work for us, still will continue to do that work. Um, again, so much of this will be relationship based. Um, sadly, it's, I think, going to be impacted by the lack of personal contact. You know, all of the um, research on um, distance learning um, suggests so far that equity gaps are actually exacerbated under these circumstances. They're not improved. 
Um, so I do think for some students, the experience of sitting at a computer and attempting to learn is going to be more alienating um, than going to class and interacting with peers personally, interacting with teachers personally. Um, I share your worries. Um, I think that we're heading into a situation in which some students, I think, um, uh, who may already be at risk are sort of put at further risk um, because of what's going on both, both in our schools and our society. So we're going to do everything we can uh, to make sure that we're doing that outreach, um, collecting good data to know who's participating and who's not. Um, but I share the worry. Director Brown. Thank you, President Appel. Um, I am going to go ahead and ask my question. Um, and this may be something that we haven't really been thinking about, um, you know, prioritizing the other priorities we have going on. Um, I'm a little nervous about, and I know our students need their Chromebooks, and I'm excited about the opportunity to provide those for students who really need them. I think I'm a little uh, nervous about um, monitoring and making, ensuring that um, the Chromebooks are used for their intended purposes. Um, I know that some districts have uh, the online system that's a part of G Suite called Hapara, uh, where uh, we can monitor uh, what students are doing on their, their Chromebooks or um, uh, forbid them from going to certain websites that aren't um, educationally provided from the district, um, and this may be something that we should um, think about and consider, um, especially if we're not going to be able to be there with our students while they're working from home. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that question. I, I do believe that all of our devices um, are set with those educational controls already intact. Um, I don't know that we'll be able to get an answer this evening from Jay Nitschke, our Director of Instructional Technology. Um, if I'm wrong, I'm sure he'll correct me tomorrow and we'll be sure to uh, get information to the board about what controls we do put on our devices as we're, bar as we're lending them out. Um, and I'm, I wanted to, Associate Superintendent Tiara, I wanted to go back, I forgot to call on you. Um, so if you have any comments to any of the, um, the, the information that Superintendent Stevens has presented, either about the grades or actually about any other part of the educational home, 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 whatever, home teaching, home, home lessons, that would be good. Thank you. Um, so what I want to talk about is just to piggyback on what the superintendent said, it's really important for us to find a protocol in place that we can monitor students who are participating so we can then as an equity as for an equity lens so we can continue those relationships and reach out to those families and students who aren't participating we still have our schools in place as you said and schools who have their unique relationships and personalities that we will re continue to rely on we have our um, office of family engagement we have our work with um, student support services as well. I actually did meet with um, our manager of admissions last week to talk about what changes do we need to do to operationalize in our current reality. So consider thinking about what does it look like for the family experience now with regards to um, enrolling students in admissions. So we have the priority for this last week and a half has been around the instructional focus of getting our plan up and running and getting our students um, resources and our families resources and now we can move into some of the day-to-day -day operational issues of the district. Thank you um, Associate Superintendent Tiara and I want to say that we've all kind of recognized that Brent came into this district and had to deal with all of this stuff right away. And I want to say the same thing to you and to Sam and the other people who are also here. You are doing an excellent job of responding to an unprecedented challenge for, for the district, or any district. Okay, thank so. You. Thank you. Sure. Well, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna let that, um, let close this item now. And if I would say, board members, if you have any other questions or other questions come up, you know, please. Oh, I'm sorry. What we did? Somebody else just talk. Right, President Pelvin, um, this is an action item, isn't it? Um, yes, we we made it an action. Oh, to to to. Um, yeah, Superintendent Stevens. I I, I was just going to close the discussion. Oh, okay. Um, but um, I think if people have other questions, 
they should just make, you know, ask, ask Brent when you have time. And, and Dr. Stevens, do you want us to pass this distance learning plan or did you want to wait? Um, no, I don't. I, I, I wasn't uh, quite certain, uh, President Appel, if there would actually be an action item to come out of this. Um, um, so I don't know that I'm uh, requesting any action from the board this evening. Um, as I'm recalling our discussion, you wanted to leave it as an action in case something did come up that would permit the board to take action. Uh, but, but no, I don't, I don't have a request. That's kind of what I thought. Um, Superintendent Stevens um, is correct that I asked that it be an action item in case anything came up in the conversation that we decided we wanted to take action on. Um, but they're not asking us to take action on anything. Okay. Um, Director Labor, Director. This, will this come back again to us just as an update um, at the next board meeting? Yes. Uh, yeah, we've been uh, uh, together with President Appel contemplating um, uh, using all of our board meetings to provide the community with updates on COVID-19 and our response. Director Sinai? Will the plan uh, be writ, um, be translated into Spanish, Dr. Stevens? Yes. So that families? Okay. Yeah, so it uh, doesn't exist in translated form yet. This is uh, hot off the presses. It's only hours old, but that's the next step. Okay. And I think you're still, you're still planning on doing some revisions as, you know, as it continues to make its way through all of the many eyes. So I don't think it would be appropriate for us to um, I think a short and sweet kind of what's coming your well, coming our way would really help families know in Spanish it's coming, but the, and this is what it might might have some just core ingredients of, of your distant one. Yeah. I think actually keeping all parents updated would be all families updated would be. I mean, I think the district has been doing a good job of that, but I, I agree like a very specific and to the point communication about this. I'm sorry, what were you going to say, Superintendent Steve? Uh, yeah, today's communication to families um, uh, both shared the core elements of the distance learning plan. Uh, the seven elements that I went over in tonight's presentation also shared the news about the six counties, seven counties going out until May 1st. Um, and tomorrow we'll plan on a quick cover letter along with um, the full 12 page family version of this. Um, we'll get that out to everybody so they can see it. In English and Spanish? Uh, uh, we hope to have the translation done by uh, tomorrow, if possible. Um, I think that there's probably enough going on that we may release the English version first and follow up with the Spanish as soon as it's available. What I heard from um, Director Leva Cutler, if I may, Beatrice, is a request that at least a short message go out in Spanish so the Spanish-speaking parents know that this is coming, even if you don't have it translated yet. Sure. Yes, we'll, we'll be sure to do that. Great. Alrighty then, so let's move to the next item. 12.2 is the updated budget development calendar. Oh, I'm sorry, Director Hem. You're, you're mute. Hi, oh. I'm sorry. Um, I just want to thank you super quickly before we moved on um, from talking about all of that stuff that we were talking about, um, you know, short-term things and stuff that's coming up soon. Um, but I just kind of wanted to open this up to thought and we don't have to like come up with anything right now, just like those who are watching and then um, all of us on the board as well. Just um, there's, I'm sure that everyone's kind of felt this a little bit, but there are definitely some, you know, wounds that are coming out of this in terms of like community and like, and you know, it is sad for some of us that are actually for most of us that some of our, um, you know, like last day of high school was on a Thursday and we didn't even know. Um, and that goes for the underclassmen as well too. And I'm sure middle schoolers and elementary schoolers probably too. But um, I just want us to kind of sit with everyone of any ideas of what we could possibly do moving forward to kind of, um, bring people together later when we can um, to not necessarily fix the wound, but just kind of um, make things a little bit, you know, better, just because I know that a lot of people are hurting over this. Yeah, um, I really appreciate the, the comment. You know, I've uh, had a number of um, both families and students reach out with um, very obviously 
uh, questions from seniors about things like prom and graduation. Um, if things don't change, you know, in terms of direction from health officials, I think we all recognize that those events won't be able to continue. Um, they then have proposed that they just be postponed and not canceled and that we figure out a way when we get out of the woods um, to, to, to reunite and celebrate the accomplishments of seniors. Um, so please know that I'm open to that. Uh, I hope that the worst won't come to pass, um, but we recognize that we're going to have to think flexibly to, to, to give you all exactly what you deserve as you finish your careers here. I really appreciate that, but yeah, yeah. Um, I also wonder if families or parents have any ideas or thoughts on it who would, um, you guys can reach out to me. I'm sure that my, my email is posted. Um, I'd love to talk to anyone who has any thoughts or just wants to talk about it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, Director Hemp, I, um, I'm home with a kid who acts actually a senior in college. And so he's facing a lot of the same struggles. And so, it, you know, it's, you try and you, I think people try to, they know that, that we have no control over this. So try to, to kind of reconcile themselves that it's, it is the way it is. But obviously things like your high school graduation are things that many students really look forward to. And it is a point of, you know, of, of passage. So. I appreciate you bringing it up and we will continue to think about that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so now I am going to move forward and to 12.2, which is the updated budget development calendar. And I'm assuming that Assistant Superintendent Follinsby is gonna, is that your item or is that Steven? Is uh, that no, I'm, I'm gonna stay on board for this one. And this isn't so much about the numbers as it is trying to recover our budget building process. Um, so I'll just be, um, I wanted to update the board about how we're contemplating trying to get back on track after the blow we've taken. Okay. And with that, I, I may jump in. So I'm going to uh, pull up the slide. I'll share my screen so that everybody's able to follow along and anticipate this will be considerably shorter than the last one. I think you have 20 minutes. Great. Um, so that's 10, 15. Uh, so, so again, this, uh, this presentation is meant only to um, uh, uh, bring the board and members of the public back up to speed about uh, our budget construction process. Um, this was actually the single most important line of work going on in the district um, prior to COVID-19. Uh, and so uh, we don't have the luxury, of course, of letting it go. Uh, and so want to figure out how to recover some semblance of a community engagement process uh, and get to the finish line on our budget development. Um, since March 16th, you've seen the slide, um, there, there are um, quite a bit of things going on in California, but, but primarily we've been impacted by this anxiety, the shelter in place order and all of these school closures. Um, and all of my colleague superintendents have, have, have offered uh, that most of the standard processes in their districts have been interrupted over the last two weeks. Uh, that's true for us. We've done no work on this for two weeks and we need to get back to it. Um, before any of this happened, we had planned to follow this uh, budget engagement calendar. Um, this is a modification of last year's process that involves a whole variety of community engagement committees uh, that includes uh, of these alphabet soup of, of acronyms, the student, uh, bud, uh, sorry, Superintendent's Budget Advisory Committee, uh, Berkeley School Excellent Plan Policy and Oversight Committee, Educator Advisory Committee, the Parent Advisory Committee, the District English Language Advisory Committee, and the PTA Council. Um, uh, all of those committee meetings were disrupted because of what's going on. Uh, just to remind the Board of Education and members of the public where we were uh, in the budget building process. On March 11th, uh, the last time that we were together as a, a, a board in a regular, agen a regular agendized meeting, uh, the board had approved uh, $901,000 in reductions to the general fund. Uh, the board had also approved um, one addition to the general fund, uh, that is for a, a, a Title IX investigator. Uh, and then the board voted to um, uh, not take action on about $617,000 in shifts from the general fund to a variety of other budget sources. Uh, we also have work to do on our LCAP budget. 
uh, we understand that we have some reductions that we'll need to make to our LCAP budget or some creative budgeting. Uh, and this has to do with two things. It's both the uh, decrease in, in anticipated revenue to the LCAP budget, largely as a result of the decrease in the COLA. Uh, and then um, uh, we are uh, experiencing a decline in the number of unduplicated students here in Berkeley. Uh, right now we have 255 less uh, than the previous year. And so we've projected out some sort of decrease in, in um, uh, revenue uh, that amounts to $139,000 this year, $324,000 next year, almost a half a million dollars in 21-22 for a total combined reduction of $947,000. That's a reduction in anticipated revenue. So um, just to quickly propose how we want to get back on track with all of this. Um, I'm proposing that we will reconvene the uh, superintendent's budget advisory committee on April 14th. That's after break. Um, we'll have to use all of this remote communication technology to pull that off. Um, I'm imagining that will probably be the final convening of the SBAC for this year, uh, and that we'll do um, uh, take on three topics, uh, whether or not there are any uh, additional possible reductions to the general fund, um, the impact of the school closures on BUSD. I'd like to be able to offer us back a preliminary estimate of what we will spend as a result of all of this. Uh, and then uh, a proposal potentially for any additional expenditures for the 2021 school year. Uh, in terms of the BSEP p and we've actually been able to get back on track uh, with our schedule. In fact, we didn't miss a beat. Uh, last night, uh, BSEP p and uh, met remotely um, to approve two budgets, the professional development and evaluation budget, uh, and then to hear uh, preliminary budget proposals on libraries. BAPA and instructional technology. And so we'll anticipate at the board meeting on April 15th that we'll be bringing those two BSEP approved budgets to the board for approval. Again, that's the professional development and evaluation uh, budgets. Uh, and then at this uh, subsequent board meeting, we'd be bringing some additional budgets uh, to the board for final approval. Uh, in terms of the Parent Advisory Committee and then the District English Language Advisory Committee, uh, we propose to try and get back on track uh, through Zoom uh, with DLAC on April 14th, with the Parent Advisory Committee on April 16th. Uh, and those particular uh, committees will focus uh, exclusively on the LCAP budget, on that $5.5 .5 million tranche of uh, funding. Uh, and then I've been in touch as well um, uh, with a few folks about reconvening our educator advisory committee. So we will tentatively plan to bring that group back together on April 13th, again, via Zoom. Uh, and that will be deliberations very specifically focused on the LCAP portion of our budget. So what I'm anticipating then is on April 15th that we will come back uh, with recommendations for action to the board. Uh, uh, one on general fund recommendations that would include some uh, potentially some additional reductions, uh, go back and uh, contemplate the transfers from the general fund to other funding sources, uh, and then potentially some expenses. Uh, we'll also then be bringing BSEP budgets for professional development uh, for evaluation and then for technology libraries and VAPA. They will have been um, reviewed and likely approved by PO prior to the 15th. Um, we'll also then have some additional recommendations for reductions to the LCAP budget, um, I'm hoping. Uh, and then we'll offer to the board a first accounting of some of the expenses associated with COVID-19. Um, so all of this is just to say we're going to get the, the, the budget roadshow uh, back together and plan to bring it back to the board when we convene next on the 15th. And that is it. Fantastic. Um, so um, I or do board members raise your hand if you have any questions for Superintendent Stevens. I mean, raise your hand on the, you know, on the participant list. All right, well, it looks like Superintendent Stevens, that was a great recap. And, oh, Julie is raising her actual hand in life. <laughs> yes, go ahead, Director Sue. My real hand I thought was raised as well. I mean, my, my virtual hand. <laughs> um, just quick question as you're developing the budget. Um, is it is it wrong to assume that the unfortunate um, time that we're in might actually pose um, some savings? And are you um, looking at that as we're developing the budget on what savings we might actually experience? 
Uh, we're going to try our best. So uh, again, right now we can't, uh, we're not um, scoring all of the potential expenses. We're keeping track of them, but we haven't sort of accurately tracked them all to the most appropriate revenue source. Um, I do think that in uh, net, we will have expended more than we save as a result of the work that we're doing. Um, the sheer volume of work to implement the distance learning plan, uh, the potential loss of our fleet of Chromebooks, or at least a portion of it, uh, replacement costs related to books that we'll be um, also lending out um, or giving away. Um, all of those things, um, I think, represent costs. Um, very likely savings will come about in the form of professional development plans that we weren't able to finish, uh, but there won't be any staff savings. We're committed to paying for all of our staff through the entirety of the school closure period in keeping with the governor's directives to all public schools to, to, to keep paying. So we'll see how, we, how it uh, plays out in the end. So can I, just a quick follow-up? Yeah, go ahead. In the sense of, um, if the Senate, if, if the federal legislation passes. It does pass. Okay, it passed, thanks. Um, where the extended um, EDD unemployment for full salary goes through, are we still committed to us paying our employees or is there an opportunity to leverage EDD at all? Uh, it'll depend on the, the employee type, but all of our BUSD employees were committed to paying through the entirety of, of the school closure event. Um, we've got a number of like, like ancillary service providers, so contractors, um, and then even um, I'd call them fourth party contractors. These are folks who are subcontracting to folks who are subcontract or who are contractors. Um, those are folks very likely who are going to have to lay off uh, their people, and we can't make those kinds of financial commitments to employees that are uh, peripheral to our organization. But right now, um, our plan is to pay all of our employees through the through the school closure event and, and not lay anybody off. Okay, other questions for Director Stevens or Superintendent Stevens or um, Assistant Superintendent Follinsby? Is there anything you want to add to that? It's okay. It's okay. I can answer. I can ask it later. Actually, um, Dr. Stevens is absolutely correct. Um, Senate Bill 117, we're committed to paying our employees and our contractors um, because the state is going to be holding us harmless in terms of our funding. And they're in turn requesting us to, um, to pay our contractors and our employees during the school closure. So at this point, I, don't, I have not seen any savings we're giving a 5% differential for staff who've been asked to work. So that's an additional cost and I'm sure IT um, costs will um, go up as well, but we're monitoring it and we'll report back to the board. Thank you, Assistant Superintendent Follinsby. Um, Director Leva Cutler, did you have a question? I think we have time for one more. You know, I was just curious in terms of um, people like who are bus drivers, um, who, you know, are bus drivers, who else are gardeners, and I know our custodial staff are working on, you know, on our facilities, um, but a very, you know, in terms of where can we find things for, for our bus drivers, for instance. Yeah, we're, um, I, uh, so again, all of our employees are being paid. So bus drivers right now obviously aren't transporting children around the city. Um, they are being paid nonetheless. Um, you can see how much work we've been doing just to make sure that we organize our teaching ranks. Um, and bit by bit, we're sort of um, uh, 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 moving through employee groups to think about the best way that they can serve the district under these conditions. Um, again, our commitment was that nobody would be financially penalized because of a situation that's outside of their control. And we're trying to figure, uh, figure out sort of uh, work for employee groups that is possible um, mm. under the current circumstances. Um, we just hadn't ever expected that we've had employee groups under these circumstances. Thank you. Um, direct, I actually just noticed that Director Brown and Vice President Alper have their hands up. Um, and so Director Brown, no, that was a mistake. Oh, sorry. that was a mistake. Vice President Alper? Um, <coughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, was, I wasn't going to say anything, but, um, and I know I've kind of said this before, but since we're going into a new, like, changed budget um, calendar, uh, 
you know, to me, the, I mean, I appreciate the, the, the accounting that it sounds like we're going to do in terms of how much more we're paying for things that we didn't expect to and potentially what we're not paying and saving, but just seems, just seems like um, really likely that the state budget is going to take a huge hit um, that the colas that we are expecting could very easily be decreased right. even to zero in, in a, yeah. you know, in a coming year. Um, that Prop 13 reform seems much less likely even to get on the ballot um, now. And, and that, well, so whatever, whatever possible, it doesn't seem like our staff thinks that we're gonna save money through this even if we did, or, or if that might end up being a wash, but it seems whatever that number is, is gonna be dwarfed by potential cuts to our, the revenue that we create. And so um, I just, just so that it's not a, like a surprise, I mean, I do, I know I sound like our former colleague, Josh Daniels in saying this, but as one board member, I just wanna sort of put my sort of marker down that going forward, um, I, I can't, I, I don't, I can't, I don't think that I would be able to support certainly any significant new ongoing expense that wasn't directly related to this crisis because we're gonna to have to make um, such extensive, we were already gonna to have to make such extensive cuts next year, even before this, um, that it just seems irresponsible of me to, to, to um, contemplate new expense change. Um, so anyway, I. I shouldn't say irresponsible that without having heard more about them, but I'm just really nervous about what our budget situation is going to be in in the fall. And that, and I know, and I'm sure that Associate Superintendent, Assistant Superintendent Fallon, we will be hearing more from the state. Um, but it seems like modeling what lower colas would look like in terms of the cuts we would have to make to balance our budget might be something that is worth doing, so that we can really see what if the cola goes down to two percent or next year it's at 0%, you know, what would that really mean for us? Because we went through that in 2008. I wasn't on the board, but some of you were. Um, anyway, so I just wanted to kind of make that comment. Thank you. Appreciate that, Ty. Um, what, um, um, Assistant Superintendent Follins, we do have, or, or Director, I mean, Superintendent Stevens, do either of you have a response to that? Uh, yeah, I, I think that it's it's sort of a wise stance to adopt. Um, we're all watching as the stock market falls apart. Um, we're watching what we anticipate to be large scale unemployment as a result of COVID-19, which just means um, a slowed economy and slowed tax revenue. Um, that ultimately turns into slowed revenue for the schools. Um, so I do think that um, sort of sounding a note of caution is really appropriate at this moment. We just don't know what's coming. Okay, so that's, I'm gonna close that item. And now we're going to the second opportunity for- oh, President Appel. Yes. I think that one, sorry, so it was an action that- I'm I know, but there's no action to be taken. We don't, we're not approving the calendar. Um, sorry, sorry, again. Um, oh, okay. Same as the last time. I, I okay, hadn't, sorry. hadn't proposed to uh, request an action from the board. Okay, my fault, sorry. No, you're right, they are action items, but it's just like because now in this current stance, we can only take action if it's on the agenda as such. Yeah. And we yeah. cannot take action. So, um, but thank you for, for mentioning that. Um, so now I'm going to go to the open session public testimony second opportunity. And so if there are any of you attendees who want to, to make public comment, um, please raise your hand now. There's 51 of you attendees left, so maybe somebody wants to say something. Well, apparently not, so um, that's okay. Um, and then I, do any of the board members wanna make any additional comments? No, right. just as a reminder that all of us can hold um, office hours through Zoom or through you know, people calling us up too. That's true. And my actually my office hours are, are supposed to be this Sunday. So um, I will have to find out from I'll have to find out from um, Jay how to how to host a zoom meeting and, and then we'll um, have Carol send them out. And if others can do that too, if you have office hours coming up, we could send it out in one email. It's probably easier.
President Appel, apparently there's a couple of comments. Uh, somebody, uh, Trish just did in the chat. Um, I'm sorry. There are two requests for public comment. Oh, yeah, you look, some people oh. raised their hands. Okay, so there are two requests, oh, four requests. Oh, gosh. I am so happy that um, we did our comment so that you could take time to do it. Um, so I'm going to call on Ingrid Murillo first. Hi. Hi. Hello. Well, my wife went to bed, but I'm still awake. My name is Orlando Murillo. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. Uh, well, I just want to appreciate everything you guys have done so far and taking the time to, uh, to take the time to explain everything what's going on. And I'm sure this is, you know, new to all of us, but I just want to say thank you for explaining um, everything that's going on with, this, with, with the school and my head goes down to the superintendent for as much as I hate his emails, but I actually appreciate everything that he does to explain to us what's going on so we can be informed. And, and I just hope that whatever it is that we are working on, that we help those who are in needs of, I think somebody asked the question about how we're gonna uh, support families who don't have internet, uh, computers, and how we're gonna help them out and so I just want to make sure that we don't leave those families behind. Some of us are in a better uh, position, in a better place to assist and help our children. And there are some of those who are not. So I just want to um, address that. And, and it has been addressed before. So I just want to make sure that uh, we keep those families in mind. And they're very important to us as much as everybody else. So I just want to say thank you and I appreciate everything you've done. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Mr. Murillo. Um, next, I have Natalie Lavanda. Um, Jay, can you, oh, talking permitted. Um, Natalie, I think you're still muted, maybe on your computer. Can you unmute yourself and then? Okay, yes. Can you hear me now? Now we can, yes. Great. Hi. Uh, first of all, I want to um, thank all of you for all your hard work. Um, I know these are very, very difficult times, and I think you're doing a great job. Um, my understanding uh, from Superintendent Stevens is that there's going to be, uh, there's not going to be face-to-face -face instruction, or the face-to-face -face instruction is going to be very, extremely limited. Um, and I'm just, I'm, I'm wondering why that is, because I know that some districts, uh, let alone the private schools, um, have been able to put together face-to-face uh, -face instruction on a daily basis. For example, um, Oakland Unified School District, I know that um, they meet uh, each class, and it's, I think it's for the high school, at the high school level. Um, they meet each class, each subject meets one to three times a week, uh, at least online, face to face. Uh, I know Piedmont is doing the same. So I guess I'm wondering, my question is, what is preventing our district from implementing similar practices? Thank you, um, Natalie. We, we don't usually answer questions during public comment, but I do want to allow Superintendent Stevens the opportunity to clarify. Uh, thanks, President Appel. Um, so uh, the, the examples that the, um, the caller is citing have largely to do with the high school. Um, uh, and they're very similar to the plans that we're offering as well. If you think about high school students having multiple classes, each of those instructors offering an office hours 
Um, if you um, put those into the week, we're talking about multiple contacts for educators across the span of the week. Um, I don't hear that it's that much different than other district plans. Uh, we have been taking a lot of care to pull up district plans when they're available. Uh, not a lot of districts have actually sort of gone live with written plans yet, and so it's difficult to do the compare contrast, although we certainly hear stories about, um, about either individual educators or other districts and their plans as well. Um, so we think, especially at the, the, um, the uh, secondary level, the plan will be quite comparable. Um, and then uh, 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 when we contemplate not every individual educator creating their own content, but having these curated teams, um, we actually think that we'll be able to expand the quality of offerings across the entire district and reduce some of the variability that I think was probably part of some other district's plans. So we'll see how it goes. Um, uh, only time will tell as we try to put this into place whether or not it's working in the way that we hope. Okay, so I have one more speaker. Oh, two more. So we're going to go to Laura Babbitt and, um, and Robert Collier and then Mo, and then that's it for the night. Hello, this is Laura Babbitt. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. I just wanted to give a quick comment regarding the Parent Advisory Committee and the timing of the budget meetings. Uh, just noting that our meeting is the day after information is already being presented to the school board directors. And um, that kind of eliminates us from being able to give advisory comments to the board during our five minutes. So I'm just hoping in the future as we do planning that we can make sure that the parent advisory committee has had a chance to weigh on these weigh in on these things before they go before the board as well. So I think that's a really helpful comment, Laura, and maybe somebody will work with you. I'm not sure how that works, but maybe someone will work with you to figure out what, a way to um, address that. Um, now next, I'm going to call on Robert Collier and then Mo. Hi, good evening. Um, <clears throat> thanks for this uh, great uh, this great discussion. Wanted to follow up on the issue of interactivity of the meetings themselves. Um, and obviously this is a whole new frontier for all of us, or at least it is for me. Um, regarding chat, you disabled chat, you mentioned that you're planning on disabling the Q&A and I totally understand why uh, you would want to do so. Um, they are wonderful um, ways of getting lots of people's questions answered in real time. Um, and at, at the PTA Council meeting Monday night, this is the first time, time I had ever done one of these um, webinars. Um, but the Q, and I was expecting the Q&A and the chat functions to be really chaotic and dysfunctional, but actually they were great. They worked out really well. And great. We were all well behaved um, and nobody was, you know, misbehaving on those, either of those two dialogue sessions, but they worked great. And so I realized there are risks uh, to having interactivity and it is not your, uh, it doesn't fit your rule book. This is not how traditional school board meetings are run, have been run, uh, and you have to stick to those rules. But going forward, I would simply invite you to, you know, consider flexible, you know, making those rules flexible because these are, and just experimenting, continuing to experiment a bit um, with these tools because they can be um, really useful for, for participants and the organizers as well as a way of sharing information in real time quickly um, on the side. You don't want to be too distracting um, and you don't want to take other risks as well, but keep it in mind. Um, and, uh, you know, we <laughs> these webinars and this remote um, uh, process may last for quite a while uh, this spring and it may come back to us again next year. So um, this is not necessarily a short-term process. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, one of my board member colleagues just reminded me that the problem is that our restrictions are about the Brown Act. And, um, but you know, I, I agree that the questions are great. And so 
we'll come up with a way to um, try to address them working with the uh, with the board. I mean, with this with the administration. Okay. Oops. Um, okay. So um, I'm gonna. I think unless there's somebody else who has a dying comment they want to make, Mo is next. And so I think we're going to wrap up with Mo unless, you know, if there's somebody else who wants to talk, just raise your hand and we have a little bit more time. But um, Mo, why don't you go ahead? Great. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, so I'm hearing a lot of anxiety around this idea of the synchronized learning opportunities and also with this idea that teachers could quickly become sick and then not have subs available for those classroom supports. And so what I think is really beautiful is that Berkeley Unified School District has spent a lot of time cultivating very beautiful relationships with partners and organizations and outside vendors that are also in education and enrichment. And I'm just wondering if there is any plan or interest in working with those partners around developing these distance learning plans and inviting them to be thought, uh, thought partners in this process because so many of those groups, like I said, they already have strong relationships with Berkeley Unified School Districts and they already have curriculum that is great appropriate and developed. Um, and so I'm just wondering if that is a relationship that can still be utilized to, in order to keep these academic plans going and support teachers with enrichment, especially in that like elementary and middle school level where those students and parents are needing a lot more support with their students. Thank you, Mo. Um, now, I, um, I realize that I did this a little early, but I do wanna give board members um, a chance to make a final comments if you want to, as well as Superintendent Stevens. And if anybody else, from the, from the administration wants to make some final comments, just raise your hand on the panelists, the participant panelist um, list. Ty, your hand is up. Did you wanna say something? Sorry, no, okay. I'm good. Well, with that being said, um, at 10.24, I'm gonna go ahead and adjourn this meeting. And I wanna thank everybody for engaging in this new technology and I think it went really well. So great job. Thank you. Thank you everybody.